It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith and Miles Udland. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what we're watching this morning. First up, futures are higher this morning as investors are optimistic that the worst of inflation may be behind us and the economy is heading for a soft landing. All three major averages on track for the third straight week of gains. Plus, it's a bear market for oil. Robust crude volume sending prices lower, heading for a fourth weekly loss, the decline complicating matters ahead of next week's OPEC meeting. The drop in oil, along with encouraging econ data, also pushing Treasury yields to their lowest levels in two months and taking pressure off equities here. And a big mover today, a seller quarter for Gap shares soaring in the pre-market trading after the retailer beat on profit in same-store same sales. That's enough to outshine the weak holiday outlook, and we're looking at a huge jump here ahead of the open. Let's get to our top story of the day, navigating times of uncertainty. All three majors are on track for weekly wins, thanks to our roaring midweek rally that came as the market grew convinced that the Federal Reserve could ease back on interest rate hikes. But fresh signs of an economic slowdown continue to spook investors as retail updates and oil's losses might be signaling a soft landing is on its way. Cooler inflation and softer jobs data were taken as signs the central bank's tightening is finally squeezing the U.S. economy. All of that paired with a uh, healthy amount of Fed speak that's come over the course of this week, which we'll dive into later on during today's show, too. Yeah, certainly. I think the big question is whether or not these gains are going to continue, right? Because at least at how the market is looking at this recent data that we've gotten now, and this has been the case for some time, bad news on the econ front, good news here for the market, just in terms of what that means for the Fed what that means then in terms of them potentially backing off of rate hikes, potentially cutting rates. And then, of course, if they're able to orchestrate the soft landing. But the narrative seems to certainly have shifted a bit or maybe investors a bit more confident that we are going to be able to get this soft landing and avoid a recession, which so many on the street have been worried about now. For yeah, I mean, I time. think there's there's two parts of what we've seen in the market over the last week. You have what we've been talking about here, the notion that we now will see a soft landing. And so investors trying to price that in has been a little bit at the heart of this action. But there's also so just this sense of people can understand what it might mean for rates to be 4%, 4.5%, let's yeah. say, on the 10-year for some extended period of time where you go back to the middle of the summer, there was still this notion that you would see 100 basis points of cuts next year, therefore bringing the 10-year back to 3.5%, right? And so you saw all this volatility in the spring around the magnitude of the move in rates, which really set off this you know, this knock-on effect in the stock market. And as we have seen the volatility in rates come down, you know, vol in stocks coming down generally means stock prices going up. And of course, we've obviously seen that just over the last couple of weeks. And it's a matter of what the Fed is going to continue to watch going forward from here. We got so much economic data that gave us more insight into the consumer, where consumers are pushing back, where inflation is still remaining sticky. Sticky in shelter. I mean, that is kind of the net takeaway that we've seen from a lot of economists that we've continued to talk about this with and in some of the services categories. But in terms of where we're also seeing this have kind of a larger main takeaway, because we got retail sales data, we also got CPI. The main takeaway, at least from Gargi Chattery over at BlackRock from CPI, was that the print was below expectations. We saw that for both core and headline inflation, returning to the cooler inflation trend we saw over the summer here. And so all of that considered deflating goods prices she notes, were once again a key story in the CPI print and overall does not derail their expectation that the Fed is going to keep rates steady for the remainder of the year, something that the markets perhaps would find some reprieve in right now. Well, you know, I don't want to step on it too much, but you have Walmart coming out this yeah. week and talking about we're going to see deflation in some, you know, some, some categories. Uh, you mentioned oil prices right off the yeah. top. Obviously, that's a main source of pressure both on the upside and the downside for household budgets. And so when you get oil prices down 20 percent in the course of, what is it, six or seven weeks or so, that's going to feed through, you know, I mean, it's not deflation again, right? Inflation at a slower pace is what we're seeing overall. But for that bucket of, you know, the way households think about how they can you know, spend their money, um, there is going to be some relief. And you can do the whole like, oh, into the holiday season, this will help. But ultimately, I think for investors, the main point is that we have more and more folks as we get this year ahead rush of, of forecasts, Goldman out with there, the hard part is over. Yeah. This notion that, you know, all the skepticism on whether there would be um, soft landing, magnificent slowdown, whatever kind of <laughs> whatever kind of superlative you want to use for this thing, uh, it may actually be happening. We may actually mm. be seeing this. I know we'll talk about uh, Mike Hartnett's note a little bit later when Matty Mills comes on the show, but there is this notion that that's becoming consensus, and that's ultimately what we're seeing in the market. Um, and as consensus congeals, 
there's a little bit of chasing going on too. I mean, the Russell yeah. 2000 over the last couple of days, really, um, Jared Blickery last week writes, this, writes this, a post in the morning brief about how the Russell undoes, you know, goes back to flat over the last three years, undoing a big pandemic trade. Well, then, of course, it goes up you know, 10 percent in the next few days. <laughs> and that's the kind of that's the kind of behavior that we're seeing in markets. Ultimately, is this chase to people trying to figure out, like, how do I explain what happened to my investments, to my clients, my sure. investors, um, you know, in 2023? Because outside of the Magnificent Seven, it hasn't. That's been a, a, little, a lot of games. It's been a little sketchy in there at times. Yeah, exactly. We've been talking about the FOMO rally, too, at least over the last couple of days. All right, let's talk about one of the big movers of the morning, and that is Gap. Better than expected results, proving that its cost-managing efforts are paying off, at least for now. A turnaround at Old Navy was a bright spot in the quarter for the retailer, with comp sales rising 1% from a year ago. Digging into this report, we know that this retailer has been struggling now for quite some time. They did, though, overall see that decline in same-store sales. Profit did beat. This is a very similar story to what we heard from a Target from Macy's earlier this week. Profit expecta- uh, profit uh, significantly exceeding expectations, smaller than expected decline in same-store sales, and that seems to be enough for the street, at least this morning. I mentioned that Old Navy growth number there, up about 1% on a year-over-year basis. They a 19% drop in Athleta, 8% drop in Banana Republic, a 1% drop in the Gap brand. So yes, maybe this is a step in the right direction, but they certainly have a ways to go in order to attain what is their goal, obviously, of driving those sales to the upside and really re- reinvigorating the entire Gap story. Yeah, I think that it's been such an interesting week for the kinds of retailers that have reported yeah. results because mm-hmm. There is some read through to the consumer, but ultimately what we're seeing in the reaction in Gap stock this morning, we saw it in Macy's yesterday, we will talk about this later in the show, it's an inventory right sizing story. Mm-hmm. It's not actually like, okay, yes, they did turn a profit. It's a cost cutting story. It's right. like a business management story more than a consumer story or a growth story or something that you're going to look at and say, oh, Gap is reinventing itself. I mean, the company on the call very forthright about, yeah, we're going to have to figure out the reinvention part, but yeah. right now we're just going to deal with like stopping uh, the stopping the missteps essentially. Like, let's stop having you know seasonal launches that you know, completely uh, fail with consumers that just are flat, that aren't differentiated, that people don't like. Um, you can go back many, many years and talk about, uh, you know, the Yay Collab and all this kind of stuff, all these problems the brand has had. Right. So in this sort of environment, though, when you look at the stock's performance over the last year, you look at a lot of its peers, the way those stocks have performed, you do have the ability to come out and say, well, we're going to, you know, we're just going to clear out the decks. You know, we're going to get everything out of the back room. We're going to take the pain now. They're guiding to mid-single digit declines for all of next year. And in this environment, that's good enough for a 20% pop in the stock. I just think there's a lot of hopium in that 20% pop in the stock. Because if you listen to this call, if you listen to what the executives are actually saying, it's hella uninspiring at yeah. the end of the day. The forecast that you're looking at, even as they look out into the full year, into the fourth quarter, balanced view of the holiday season, Inventory is well controlled, to your point, as they were mentioning, and the financial position strong. However, remaining mindful of the uncertain consumer environment. That doesn't spell out a company that's amazingly inspired by what it's seeing in the consumer demand environment. Well, I mean, but think about... In their own mix. Right, but think about what we were just talking about around, um, you know, portfolio construction, around Mm -hmm. the stories that investors need to get ready to tell themselves, tell their investors, you know, tell their clients um, come January. You don't want to be short gaps still. The company is saying we're going to stop the losses. We are going to, you know, kind of figure this thing out. And the stock has gone, I mean, I don't know what the percent loss is over the last five years, right? But you have made a lot of money. You've been right by betting against Gap. And when you see a 20% pop on, you know, a quarter that, to your point, Brad, fairly middling, let's call it, right? But it is better than feared. That kind of 20% pop, to me, suggests that a lot of folks who had been betting against Gap, pressing their shorts on the way down, are saying, okay, you know what? I think we'll get out here. It's just because, ma- I mean, stock's back at January 2022 levels. So, well, and, and, yeah, and so it's it at goes, a year-to-date high, too. Yeah. And it goes all back to what you were saying, just in terms of stabilizing the business, right? We've seen that really across the board for so many of these retailers. I mean, take a look at these inventory levels specifically here at Gap, dropping about 20, just over 20%, 22% on a year-over-year basis. They're doing everything they can to clear that backlog. We have seen that reflected in recent results when you talk about that promotional activity, doing everything they can to right-size the business. They have a new CEO. There's a lot of optimism on the street just in terms of his track record, what he's been able to do for other brands, that he is the right pick for kind of reshaping Gap going forward. He is the Barbie guy. We need to capitalize on it. And it looks like they're doing a great job. They have a lot of work, though, to do at Athleta.
Well, because that is one they, where they I was going to say, to struggle. yeah, I mean, I mean, has, has anyone been in a banana recently? I have. No. Well, you, mostly, you on the, mostly on the outlet side, but I haven't. I have been in some of their. Uh, Shauna knows, and I talked to her to, in the break too much about this, about my usual going ins and outs just to check inventory levels at stores. Uh, at you are a busy guy locations. outside of hours. Look, I got to get my steps in. I got to close all my rings, and so I got to make sure that I also, you know, check some SKUs on the way on the way home. So you got, you got to share how often you go to Foot Locker. I go to Foot Locker at, at least three times a week. Okay. At least three to just, four was lot, yeah. Like three to four. Yeah, yeah. On a good week, it's five. I think but, I know where that foot is. That one on Steinway. Right. <laughs> um, there's a few. There's okay. one near me. I go to. There's one near me. I go to that one twice a week, okay. and then there's one. Yeah, in Soho. you do your due diligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have to go there's to a couple There's also one in stores. Union Square. Yeah. So. Shana, we'll do the Short Hills Mall conversation yeah, exactly. later. <laughs> uh, we got to talk about Applied Materials out this morning too. Applied Materials shares are falling this morning as the company reportedly faces a criminal probe for shipments to China's top chip maker SMIC, according to Reuters. The report alleges that Applied Materials sent hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment to SMIC through South Korea to bypass U.S. export bans. You're taking a look at shares here pre-market uh, for Applied Materials. They're down by about 7% here as we continue to keep a close eye on that going into the start of today's trading activity just to get a look at uh, what they've been doing over the course of this year as well. Year-to-date, this company is still a beneficiary of a lot of the kind of Chips attention the thrust forward because of the AI trade that chips in this kind of applications, the models, and then the chips being the base of that larger AI trade pillar. Um, they've been one of those beneficiaries over the course of this year. However, it's come at the same time that there have been some more intellectual property curbs that have been put in place by different nation states to make sure that there's not a stealing or theft of some of those things. Yeah, I mean, the actual results from, from Applied Materials are showing you that the, um, you know, the build out of, you know, uh, let's say fab manufacturing capacity, certainly yeah. here in the U.S., that continues. And there's, even with an expected slowdown, given the kind of rush that we saw, you know, late 21 through last year, um, and, and you can kind of see it in the manufacturing um, investment numbers, Ultimately, that's not leveling off or slowing down quite at the same pace that analysts had feared. So you see fundamentally a strong quarter. But the stock reaction in the news last night, that Reuters report, really speaks to the challenge that I think the AI trade is probably going to ha has had, you know, to an extent, but likely becomes a sharpened focus into the second half of next year around the election. What happens if there's a change in the U.S. presidency around the U.S.-China relations? This week, everyone's all excited about that. I guess we're going to get new pandas back, but ultimately <laughs> there is a there is a question about what what can the market be for these Western, specifically U.S.-based chip makers or companies within the chip supply chain mm -hmm. if there is effectively no demand, or no ability to sell much of that high-end equipment, high-end technology into China. And when these stocks have had such a run, when it has been the main driver for the market overall, it's a very important question for investors to try and answer, particularly since the market action would suggest it has been answered affirmatively, meaning this is all going to be fine. This is a huge market. Buy it all. There is then an embedded kind of downside risk just because any of these surprises, any of this uncertainty, um, you know, is a negative. Now, Applied Materials comes out last night. They say, we disclosed this last year. Um, pretty cagey on, you know, the first question on the call was around this report. I mean, what's the company going to say? Like, they're not going to come out and deny it. Right. There's plenty of legal reasons why they can't say a lot. Cagey in the response. But I think ultimately the street today judging that there is some discount around what's the real TAM opportunity for their products if this kind of inquiry is is but one of the series that these companies may face. Yeah, and we know that Applied Materials within this report did post significant revenue here from their exposure to overseas, specifically to China. So we know that that obviously could have a real impact here down the line. In terms of what this find could potentially look like, I was looking at the uh, street reaction here this morning. City coming out saying that they don't anticipate further government restrictions, but if they and they and assume a worst case fine similar to what we saw at Seagate, three hundred million dollar fine for shipping to Huawei. So we'll see. Uh, obviously, it's a real concern for the street. We're looking at losses just about 7%, I believe, in the pre-market. Well, let's take a look at another mover this morning. Swedish automaker Volvo tumbling to a record low. Now, this comes after its majority shareholder, Chinese-owned Geely Holdings, sold just over 3% of its stake in the company. Geely saying that the move will improve trading liquidity for investors and allows a wider base of share and still leaves Geely with a 78% holding within Volvo. Now, this took the street by a bit of a surprise here, just given the depressed levels that Volvo has been trading at. The timing of this sale uh, certainly interesting, but they're doing what they can to raise some liquidity, better position Volvo, what they see at least 
for the future. I'm a bit surprised that this stock has not performed a little bit better, and certainly at least over the last several months. Solid. When you talk about the fact that it's not exactly, I knew you were going to go. Shouldn't here. be an underperform. Why? Well, every single one of our friends from high school has a Volvo now. So <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a family car. It is. Well, isn't that what it's? So Tesla, their whole thing is how do we tout safer than a Volvo, faster yeah. than a Porsche? Exactly. It was their entire thing. So the, yeah, the safety standards they they run higher. I think it. ultimately for any automaker right now, inclusive of Tesla, um, there's a challenge around what you are, what the story that you've been telling yourselves and investors on what the world's going to look like in 2030. You know, yeah. Volvo is among yeah. the dozens of international car makers talking about we're not going to make internal, you know, you know we're not going to make combustible engines by the end of this decade. Well, we're six weeks away from 2024. So in six years, we're not going to make the cars that are still a majority of our sales. Um, and look, the mechanics of this, it doesn't matter what the company is. When your majority shareholder comes out and says, oh, we're going to sell 100 million shares, even if everyone says it's fine, and even if it is indeed fine, you know, Volvo for all, well, they're not going to buy it back. But, you know, in theory, they could come, they could yeah. buy back the stake themselves. Um, it's just not the kind of thing that investors are going to be super excited about. There's a mechanical math thing around, oh, there's more liquidity, therefore the stocks that are currently trading, the, the shares that are currently outstanding are thus, you know, worthless. So then I think that also then leads to, is this a bit of an overreaction maybe on the street part? Obviously, I'm just sure given the fact. I'm sure people tell you that. Yeah, yeah. that's what I yeah. was saying. That yeah. was my argument. But, but I, do think, I, I do think, though, that for automakers right now, um, it's a very challenging time to articulate your strategy. Because the strategy that most automakers have articulated is that very simple, like, we're transition. We're going to spend all this money. Don't worry. In the future, everyone's going to have an electric vehicle. That's the reason why we're spending all this capital now. Right. It's going to be fine. And it's just not totally clear. And we see the signs from the GMs and the Ford on their read on the U.S. market around the demand for their next-gen um, you know, EVs. It's just not clear that the timeline that has been agreed to, which, again, generally is 2030, mm -hmm. To me, it's not clear that's going to come through. At a time where we know that there is an, an amazing and remarkable pricing war that's ensued in right. the EV exactly. landscape, mm -hmm. and Volvo, who just posted its 2024 kind of prices MSRP down the line for all of its models, the average is coming in at about $57,000 sticker. So we'll see what negotiations on lots look like, like uh, and you know, of course, in the dealer mechanisms, how much that can vary. But at the end of the day, it's it's still going to be a larger question of where those prices might still need to come down. Even even if you are still selling an internal combustion engine where people are going to say, okay, now I weigh the options of do I feel comfortable getting an EV and ensuring that I can have the chargeability or do I just stay with this ICE Volvo that I know is going to have a high safety standard because everybody else in my neighborhood has it and at the end of the day but, feel feel comfortable, I guess. Yeah, and I think it also just ties to the fact that profitability off of these EV vehicles, yeah. right? When it comes to at least their EV SUV, the EX30, there's questions about what exactly right. those margins are going to look like. It's so. just about getting them into the ecosystem yeah. at this point. We'll see. Also, since we're talking cars, let's talk about cars soon coming to your Amazon shopping cart. Starting in 2024, auto dealers will be able to sell vehicles online in Amazon's U.S. store, Hyundai, like Sunday. It's going to be the first brand available to purchase on the site thanks to a new strategic partnership between the vehicle brand and Amazon. There was uh, a, a bit more to this partnership as well. Some kind of delivery Saturdays, vehicles. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> yes, deliveries on Saturdays, maybe. Um, yeah, AWS, preferred cloud provider, yada, 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 next generation Hyundai vehicles, uh, even more responsive with Alexa built in as well. I mean, I already unplugged my Alexa, so I don't want it to come standard in my car. I have to get it. Can, can I be cynical? Sure. For the first time in the history I was of the say, yeah. <laughs> is, is there anything new about what's going to come out of your mouth? I'm checking the calendar. It's mid-November. Looks like a big product launch. A lot of people looking to lock in there. We rolled out this product release in the fourth quarter. January rolls around. Time for my promotion. Not sure there's a lot here. I mean, I guess it's fine. You can list the cars, sure, you could buy them, but I, I don't think I, I don't think Amazon's super serious about creating a, an auto marketplace. Why? Because I one, it's it, it's a highly competitive space. There are plenty of vendors around it. Mm -hmm. The margins on those are fine, but there's been plenty of you know fundamental struggles around your major online kind of auto call them auto marketplaces. Mm -hmm. The rules in the U.S. around how you actually purchase a vehicle, um, having a, you know, you know, being a, an auto dealer, um, are very onerous. They're very strict, and I'm not totally sure that for a company that has um, a very clear focus on getting stuff to my house in 12 hours, yeah. is looking at 
my once every six year purchase, or even if at least once every three year visit to a dealer, which I obviously hate and I would not, I do not want to do. I'm not sure Amazon sees that you know, very infrequent touch point as something they need to put a lot of investment behind. So then I guess, in the, guess the question then more though too is, is there really a downside to this, to so them getting into this business? Like just because the sheer size of Amazon, I think you have to take the announcement yeah. seriously to some extent. We're seeing some pressure on some of these online car dealers as a result of this, even though Amazon saying that it's going to be for new cars, we're seeing some pressure on some of those used car, yeah. uh, car dealerships as well. So I think the question is, is there a real downside to them potentially entering the car business? We know their e-commerce business, the growth there has certainly been struggling a little bit, slowing significantly. So maybe this could be a new avenue, a good way, a new way to drive some revenue. Whether or not it's really going to change yeah. or disrupt the entire industry, I think you're right with that. But it could be just... I but I think Brad's about. call out on the, the Alexa integration and then you being like, I don't use my Alexa anymore. That's exactly it. Yeah. Amazon's big enough to experiment with anything. Yeah. Sure, they'll, they'll take a peek. They'll see what happens with the car market. Right. But, oh, there's a whole team, several yeah. teams over there are all celebrating. We got this product out into market, but it doesn't really matter long term for like fundamental Amazon. It does matter, you know, for cars.com. It does matter for um, Carvana, these other players, if Amazon becomes a major player. Right. But there's not... Like it does for Amazon's fundamental long-term success, it they, it could go either way. So they might drop in a year. This so is the guy who's probably going to order his next car from Amazon. Absolutely not years. ordering a car from Amazon. <laughs> I mean, this I got to go to Salerno, Dwayne. It's terrible. But it's God. such a low That's lift effort on both of the fronts here that both companies essentially win on this. For Amazon, you just get more traffic. People yeah. who initiate a search, even if they don't have intent to purchase on the site, you can now serve them a ton of other products to say, hey, if you didn't feel like buying this car, make sure that you get your oil shipped directly to your house from yeah. an Amazon vendor, or make sure you get that part that gets wow. the fuzzy part on the steering wheel. Um, so all the, yeah, everybody wants changes that. his own oil, he's got fuzzy steering wheel. Look, man, I still got an MTA pass, fuzzy, so I don't have a steering, steering wheel. wheel. Uh, no. I always judge those. Okay. <laughs> what? Wait, did you have one? No. Okay. No. Right. So nineties. Oh, it's one of one. Actually, it's like having the. It's like having the, the, dice? the, the, the No, the, the air freshener. The air freshener. Oh, well, you got to have that. I mean, goodness gracious! If you don't see the tree in the car, get out. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk a little oil here. Oil heading for its fourth weekly loss. Increasing supply and softening oil barrel prices are some of the reasons for the drop. At the last OPEC meeting, the organization pledged to keep output curbs in place for the remainder of the year. All eyes are on the members and non-members uh, meet next week. More on what we may expect out of the oil market. We've got Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery standing by. Hey, Jared. Hey there. A couple of things in the oil market to mention. Next week, we do have that joint ministerial meeting. That's not the big one, the monthly one, where they determine whether or not they're going to uh, stay the course or enact more or fewer production cuts. Uh, but it is a prelude to that. So we're going to be watching that during the Thanksgiving week. If I have nothing else to do, you can bet I'll be doing that. Um, but there's also a Goldman Sachs report out, and it's pretty lengthy, and it's getting a lot of attention in the market. They are forecasting prices for Brent. 80 to 100 dollars. I think OPEC Plus has the juice, the power over the supply and demand, or at least supply in the market to affect that. Here we're looking at WTI crude futures. Uh, I was just talking about Brent the other way. I'll get to that in a second. But this is what they've done since midnight, up uh, almost two percent. But for the week, if we take a look at the five days, well, you can see down five percent. And let me just let me just give you a year-to-date total. Uh, you can see after this spike here, and this related to the Israeli uh, Gaza incursion there, we fell off quite a bit. And uh, I like to put this chart up as well. Here's a three-year chart that shows the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That was a much more significant supply shock for the market to digest. But since we're also talking Brent, and that's what uh, the global benchmark really is, uh, let's take a look at that. It's actually uh, at 70 about $4 higher than WTI. And let me just give you some of the predictions from Go for Goldman Sachs for the next year. Now, already for the current year, two and a half million barrels per day, that has been the growth in consumption, and that is on the demand side. That's greater than what was expected at the beginning of the year. But that two and a half is about to shrink to a one and a half over the next year, and that will put the market more in balance. So we've seen more selling than buying recently, and that has to do with the depressed prices. Hard to see on this chart, but this is actually quite significant. A lot of uh, pain that 
endured by traders who were hoping to hoping for a breakout of 100. But nevertheless, that's what we have. Uh, one more one more note right here. Uh, Brent forecast for next year, 92 barrels per uh, 92 dollars per barrel. And that's kind of in the middle of that 80 to 100 uh, dollar per barrel range. Guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much. We got to take a quick break. But when we come back, more on Yahoo Finance. We're following all your market action. We'll be right back. Let's get into the market commentary of the day. Bank of America's Michael Hartnett wrote, writing a research note this morning to clients saying that investors should fade the recent stock rally following Tuesday's CPI print market, saw, seeing jumps in small caps, financials, tech, and China exposed to assets. But Hartnett saying the risks from building technical and macroeconomic headwinds may not be worth the short-term rewards of a rally. Uh, Madison Mills is here to break it all down. Maddie. Break down everything I just said and put it in layman's terms <laughs> for everyone in terms of what Michael Hartnett what believes just happened, I blacked out. and the risk on rally that we've seen. That was great. You grabbed a lot of my first talking points here, Shauna. So that was perfect. Um, I'm going to go with what we were talking about, pulling out one word here from Hartnett, the epic risk rally of the past week that we saw, of course, due to those easing financial conditions. We saw bond yields dropping from 5 to 4%, dropping even more as we head into the end of the week, contributing to that rally here. Uh, we also saw this with that jump in small caps I've been talking about all week and shares of even U.S. regional banks uh, and China stocks as well going up. Hartnett describing that as a shift from caution to year-end greed. So uh, a little bit of selling off there uh, that we're seeing towards the end of the week. But his broader point is that, like you said, Shauna, we're going to have to do some fading above that 4,500 level and kind of breaking from some of the other bears on the street. Morgan Stanley's Michael Wilson and Goldman Sachs also holding a little bit more of an optimistic view here on the equity market, predicting that S&P 500 levels are going to be uh, at 4,500 and even 4,700 by the end of 2024, respectively. But Hartnett uh, finding a little bit more bearish sentiment, even on the oil market, too, that Jared was, was talking about earlier. What about the fund manager survey? What was revealed there? Yeah, so the fund managers uh, having a little bit more of an optimistic view. They're bullish on bonds, overweight position. Uh, the outlook for a soft landing is at 67%. The outlook 
for lower inflations at 82%. So I love to hear that. I love thinking about my cost of items going down. The rest of us, yeah. Uh, but as Miles pointed out to me before the show, the real takeaway, oh, the real geez. tea here <laughs> is that Hartnett I said. To slack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you a shout out. I'm Thank giving you. you credit. Thank you. Um, live on air, Miles. Take it. Take the win. Uh, Hartnett was saying, you know, the least likely outcome of 2024 is that all of this good news that the fund manager survey found uh, actually happens, that this consensus comes to reality heading into 2024. So we'll have to see. I mean, we always talk about this, but is the Fed going to change course after one week of great data that's led to this rally in the stock market this week? I feel like they're probably going to take a couple a couple pauses and see whether or not we're actually getting a little bit of a decrease in inflation. Yeah, and ultimately like I think the the, the good, good call out from this note is the way that, you know, behaviors from investors around trying to square up their portfolios it's kind of been the theme all morning um, can impact the market in the short term and yeah. all the stuff that was bought or sold and oil is is kind of within that within that category um, have been the things that have been either underperforming, been the laggards or have been the outperformers this year. Um, what's been interesting is, you, you know, you kind of have the buy first, ask questions later attitude in markets, and that's certainly been prevailing over the last couple of years. Think about the AI trade. Yeah. Well, right now we're getting all this information that, you know what, the fundamentals of the Magnificent Seven, they actually are awesome. There was a reason mm. to buy all that stuff. So with the regional banks right now, with the Russell 2000 right now, you have a lot of investors going out, buying all these things that got you know, superficially got super cheap, huge discounts, three-year lows to Russell, whatever you want to do with all these kind of call outs. And then everyone can, you know, sit around at Thanksgiving and say like, is this actually cheap? Should we actually be owning this? Is, mm. Or is it just going to go up a couple percent by the end of the year? And I think Hartnett really calling out that risk that people say, yeah, I didn't really mean to buy small caps. They just went up a lot. And uh, I'm going to go back to selling them because you look at the chart and it's not the most constructive thing you've ever seen in the world. Yeah. We also got to look inside of what uh, the topics are going to be at your Thanksgiving dinner table, I guess, this year, you know, too. Topics Thanksgiving dinner table is, you know, do you have to throw that on the floor? Can we not? You know, that's, <laughs> that's a topic every single yeah. night, probably. That's uh, yeah. That's All what right, Maddie, about. thanks so much. Let's get over to the opening bell right now. We're seeing a bit of a mixed picture. Dow and S&P adding to earlier gains that we saw this week. Jared Blickery standing by with a closer look. Jared. Yes, uh, mixed board indeed. Nasdaq down just marginally. Not a lot of action except in the small caps. Uh, Miles just talking about that. And let's plot the week's action. We had a huge day a couple days ago. Uh, one of the biggest, most bullish days we've seen in some time. Here's a four day look. Let's see if we can pump that up to a five day. Here we go. Still maintaining gains of 5%. Gave back a couple after that big pop on Tuesday. Uh, that's probably going to be the leader here. NASDAQ up 2%. And let's check out the S&P 500. That is up 2% as well. Just maintaining those gains this week uh, at the upper end of its range, which is pretty bullish, uh, just looking in the very short term. Now, let's take a look at the sector action. Energy, I was just talking about crude oil and the expectations for next year. Uh, but energy up 1%. That's followed by industrials, real estate materials, consumer discretionary and financials, and utilities all outperforming to the downside. Community Communication services, Staples Tech and Healthcare. So the mega caps taking a little bit of a backseat, but not for the whole week. Uh, let's check out some of the leaders. Real estate, materials, consumer discretionary utilities. Uh, interesting mix at the top. But I'll tell you what, this rally started 15 days ago. So I'm going to give you that look right here. Tech, the number one stock. And I think since we're in the green today, that's probably another uh, record high. Uh, just incredible what's happened in the price action. Doesn't look like we have that intraday record high just yet. But here's a five-year look. And I just want to show you, this is a giant cup and a flag there, not quite a handle. Or maybe this is a handle. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, we have broken to the upside. That is hugely bullish because when you have a pattern that has lasted two years, well, you might get two years worth of upside uh, just on a measure move basis, uh, looking for probably this distance. You take this down to 120, add it to there, and that is your target. Uh, just a little interesting uh, introspection into the trading world there, hopefully. Uh, this is what's happened in the world over the last 15 days in our leaders. Only a small oil ETF is down 5%. But look, innovation, ARC is up 24%. Home builders up 17%. Regional banks, remember those guys? Those are up 16%, so kind of like an everything rally that we've seen. And I'm going to just dial this back down. This is a NASDAQ 100 to what's happened this week. You can see Amazon taking a little bit of a dip there, but Tesla up 7%, Apple up another 2%. Things just looking pretty bullish uh, on most time frames. Not so much the intraday just yet. We'll have to see how the day closes and the week closes, but looking at a little red here, Microsoft Alphabet each down 8 tenths of a percent, Tesla down 2%, guys.
I'll study some of the earlier games that we've seen this week. All right, Jared, thank you. Let's talk about one of the big movers of the day. It certainly has been a huge week for retail earnings. Well, Gap shares today soaring up just about 22% at the open after the company beat on profit, but it's still forecasting a weaker consumer for the holiday season. Based on what we've seen so far, consumer spending is just a bit soft, maybe a bit softer than we had anticipated and is expected to stay that way. So let's talk about what it means for Gap, some of its rivals out there. We want to bring in Corey Tarlow. He's Jeff Jeffrey's analyst. Corey, it's great to see you here. So starting with Gap and what we heard last night, we're seeing shares pop uh, in early action this morning. It was a beat in terms of uh, what we saw on profit. The sales decline was less than expected, yet guidance was a bit muted. Do you think the reaction, I guess, that we're seeing, the hype that we're seeing at the open is warranted? Well, I, I think it's a function of positioning. So I think largely many people, many investors have been very long consumer defensive names uh, like Walmart and uh, have been a little bit more negative on those that skew a little bit more discretionary and where there's been inherent underperformance. And so far, what we've seen in Gap, at least when as of the last quarter, was a massive turnaround at the Old Navy business. And I think that that is probably the most important thing to key in on because Old Navy represents over 50% of sales and profits for the business, we think. And it, it really, I think, drives the bus, so to speak, for the overall sales and profit trajectory of the enterprise. And to see after a number of quarters of same store sales declines, to see that inflection positively is, I think, welcome news. Yeah, about 55% of the, the sales for the most recent quarter, Old Navy representing for uh, Gap. So as Marshawn Lynch would say, putting the team on its back. Uh, you know, at the end of the day here, Corey, when you think about the fact that we're seeing Gap shares hit a uh, year-to-date high, a 52-week high as well, should investors be chasing Gap at this level? Um, there is some inherent risk in that because... Well, there are several other banners that are also underperforming at the moment, like Athleta, which is down uh, very significantly double digits um, versus the prior year, and Banana Republic, which is also continuing to underperform as well. So uh, overall, you're seeing, I think, some areas zig, other areas zag. And so we, we view the risk reward, I think, uh, as a little more balanced at, at present levels. You know, Corey, I want to ask a little bit um, about the quarter from Walmart. You mentioned, you know, the positioning impact that, um, ha you know, has been felt on all these individual stocks. But you look at the major retailers this week, it's one of the only ones calling out major year-over-year -year sales increases. How did you think about the quarter, the reaction we saw yesterday, and, you know, just where you see, you know, that company going in the year ahead, given the kind of consumer call-outs that they had on the call yesterday? I'm very encouraged by largely what I've heard from Walmart recently. It's very rare that a company beats on sales, beats on earnings, raises the full year earnings outlook, and trades down the magnitude that Walmart did yesterday. So to me, as I think about the prospects for this business ahead, a potentially softer economy, the benefits that Walmart could realize from consumers trading down into Walmart, to drive traffic growth, uh, all should, I think, drive better sales and profit ahead and get me really excited about owning Walmart over the next 12 to 24 months. So, Corey, with that in mind, then, where does that leave Target? There was lots of, uh, I guess, excitement around the profit beat that we saw sales, though, still just a bit disappointing. When you take all, into, all that into account and look ahead to 2024, how do you see Target stacking up against its biggest rival, Walmart? I think what's most interesting here is that the question that we were getting into the quarter was very simple. Uh, amid declining comp sales, can Target still drive a mid-single-digit operating margin? And what we saw both this quarter and last quarter is that the answer is yes. Because I think for many investors, the concern was amid declining sales, would profitability be sustainable? And what we've seen is that the profits have been sustainable. They've been sustainable in spite of higher shrink, unlocked by inventory management, uh, more favorable freight, and then higher levels of sales and traffic versus uh, pre-COVID levels. So I think uh, the CFO cited on the earnings call that traffic, interestingly enough, versus I believe 19 levels, the first three quarters of this year is up 
over 20%, which is quite impressive and I think speaks to the uh, sustainability of the business overall. All right, this many retail companies reporting in one week. Corey, I imagine this has been like a face in front of fire hose type of period for you. So we're going to send over an espresso shot, help you make it through Friday. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Corey Tarlow, Jeffrey's analyst, joining us here this morning. It has been a big week for retail earnings and some good, some not so good. Well, how should we or would we rank them? And let's be clear here. There are some defining characteristics about how companies have been performing over the course of this week. And we can choose to kind of evaluate based on a few things, whether that's the management commentary, whether that's them actually beating on what the street expected and the guidance going forward from here. And, you know, whether consumers are still going to flock into these stores and what the foot traffic looks like. We've got four key ones that we're going to toss up on the screen. We've got like a little Yahoo Finance bracketology, if Before you Before we do here. the we, this, you did this. Yes. So, no, no I'm saying, so, I, you know, well, it this was, is it was Brad's collected. view. It's Brad's view. And then, you know, we'll, we'll well, We're going to weigh in. Shauna and I will be like, oh, we agree or disagree. Okay. All right, fine. Well, <laughs> let me Although, make full disclosure, I did, Brad and I consulted a little bit on this. Yes. But go ahead. This is a different plan than I heard. It was so, okay. Smith so, and Smith, LLC. I was going to say, should I change my name for the show? Okay. So let's toss it up on the screen. Want to be invited back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, he sits right over there. He watches the show way That's too right. much. It's easy to get off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's toss up the the bracketology here because first matchup here we want to talk about Home Depot versus Walmart. Think about the weeks that we saw. Ultimately, let's start with Walmart just to get this one out of the way because ultimately you just heard Corey Tarlow on with us saying that he was very encouraged by the results. If you were taking a look at the stock price reaction over the course of this week, uh, naturally it would bump its head because because uh, it still was at some of these high levels that we'd seen. It, it set a new 52-week high coming into this report, an all-time high coming into this report as well. Um, but ultimately, this grocery business has two of the top five based on consumer research from Numerator. You've got a CFO saying Black Friday is just a concept, and they can activate deals whenever. That means they can ultimately perhaps drive demand in some of those more dampened down categories. Um, and ultimately, the quarter was still, fourth quarter in general, was about 20% larger for them too. So uh, you think about the outlook and what they're able to generate in, type, in that type of demand profile going into a heavy promotional environment as we will be. I mean, we just heard it you know, from Corey Tarler over at Jefferies. Yeah. This is one of the only companies in, within, it, certainly, it is the only company within this group of four that we're talking about here that reported year over year sales growth. Yeah. Um, and even though it was a disappointing quarter relative to some of those expectations. Uh, I think, you know, as Corey mentioned, positioning where, you know, this stock had been slightly outperforming the S&P 500, whereas the other three within this group were major laggards, relative, you know, forget about Target, down almost 30% coming into the support year to date. Yeah. Um, you know, these are laggards relative to the market. So Walmart being punished a little bit on that basis. But I think on a, you know, just kind of go through the way they talked about their own business's trajectory next year, it's hard to be super discouraged about where Walmart sees itself in what they believe is going to be a much more challenging environment next year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, clearly they're a beneficiary of yeah. the trade down of the private level, pen, uh, private label penetration, obviously certainly something that they that they excel in, something that they're seeing a, a little bit more traction. You talk about the promotions, people looking to save in every which way they can, tightening budgets, you're going to go to Walmart. So very, very well positioned. Yes, they have outperformed this year. I think there's a reason for that, obviously. Bit of a sell-off here. I think that they are much better positioned. Well, in this Home Depot. Well, yeah, I, I think so too. And in this bracket, it's Walmart got, versus Home Depot. It's Walmart right now? versus okay. Home Depot. That's what we've got on the one side, the east or the west coast of the semifinals, if you will. Um, it's really just semifinals, finals, and then we pick a winner here. So Walmart advances there. Yeah. Uh, Home Depot, just to give them a little bit of a nod here in this conversation too. They ultimately said the the trend is is not good right now. The year of moderation is what they talked about on the earnings call, which is never something that you want to continue to hear at a time where they're already seeing sales slippage as well here. Um, so let's get to the East Coast side of this power ranking. Not a lot of suspense here. Uh, huge suspense. <laughs> we, um, so we revealed it. Target's probably going to win here. Um, there's a good chance because we already to made no the graphic. Um, but they were going up against Macy's here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I will say, I, I kind of felt like Macy's could have been the winner here. Really? And so the, the thing is, both companies... The shares of both companies basically did the same thing following the company's result, which was, you know, Target said inventory levels are getting right size. Macy's talks about um, essentially the same thing, cleaning up the, you know, the back room, all this sort of stuff. So both shares pop on that news. But to me, Target continues to, I mean, again, the stock had been down 30% 
year to date. It continues to be a story that is moving more about what is happening at Target specifically versus how is Target responding to the environment. I mean, this is like, you know, a number one thing that um, I feel like is a Sazi take at this point in time, which is like, there's a management story here that's well beyond how the company is positioning itself within you know, the broader context. And you could say, well, they're more levered to discretionary items in the store. They should have more grocery, right. you know, where Walmart has you know, an overweight there, and that's why you have the returns profile in the stock. But you know, this was the 2019 Yahoo Finance Company of the Year, mm. um, and it's been quite a journey over the last four years. You know, they're the leader, um, or they were the first company to come out and talk about retail theft. There's just been a lot of challenges at Target. And I know the stock had a nice reaction on Wednesday, but it doesn't feel like this is a story that necessarily has gotten itself sorted out because of one quarter of some inventory discipline. You never want to be the leader in shrink, we should probably notice. Yeah, it's like it shrink's a thing, and actually it was a little bit less of a thing, honestly, this quarter, which was right. interesting to talk about. But you know, they were on the leading edge of that, you know, to, as far as as far as I'm concerned. And you know, maybe someone would view another retailer as part of that. But to me, Target was the defining part of that's why everyone's talking about shrink. Yeah, in terms of quantifying it and exactly yeah. what it means for their business. I also think that there's reason to be optimistic about Macy's going forward. They have a new CEO. CEO that's yep. going to be taking over in the new year. They were able to get a better handle on their inventory levels. You can make that same argument for Target as well. Same store sales declined less than expected, very similar to some of the trends that we also see play out at Target. But when it comes to that profit beat, when it comes to the fact that they did have better margin performance, it could set Macy's up for potentially gains here heading into the new year. They just have to weather through what could be a challenging couple of months, not only for Macy's, but really across, obviously, the broader retail landscape. All right, well, Macy's loses this matchup. However, they will still get their parade on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Ultimately, here, let's get to the finals just very briefly. We've got Target matched up versus Walmart. And I think for a lot of analysts that we've spoken to over the course of this week, it still comes back to groceries. Groceries, Walmart has about 25% Walmart U.S. has about 25% of the grocery market. That's before you even really factor in a lot of where Sam's Club adds into that. And Sam's Club is perhaps one of the better levers that Walmart has to pull versus a target here in that you've got both the big box side, but also you've got the wholesale and buy in bulk side as well that consumers typically see as one of the inflationary hedges that they can pull on their own household balance sheets as well. Yeah, and, and you know, just a final thing, um, in looking at this group that we talked about and you know, how much of a read-through do they offer to the consumer, I think Walmart, um, it's widely accepted that it, there's, there's a big part of that. But when you look at the trades in the retail sector, consumer-centric names, the stocks that have done really well, there are plenty. It's just not kind of in this general merchandise kind of grouping. Chipotle, Amazon, Decker's Outdoors, everybody loves their Uggs still. Uh, Williams-Sonoma, which yeah. had been you know, a prospective member of this bracket. That. Yes. You know, that's been a stock that's done really well. <laughs> Booking Expedia, obviously travel trade's still there. And then I know you're gonna talk about it later, you know, DR Horton and Lennar. Mm -hmm. The home builders themselves, Home Depot has had its problems, but the home builders have a lot going for them. So there's been plenty of ways to play the resilient consumer. It has been interesting to see that this four kind of classic grouping of retailers um, has really not been the way to do that. Yeah, we'll see. Outside of Walmart, I should say. You know, yeah. the Home Depot, Targets, the Macy's, the World, the Gaps, that's been a challenge. All right, well, we'll see. But So Walmart is Walmart. the winner. I Walmart's think we're all winner. in agreement that Walmart should be yeah. the top winner, at least of this small this is the semifinal bracket. Stock goes down the most with. of the group, but they get to win the day. <laughs> they win the power rank. I was still going to give you time to talk you about Williams potential. Sonoma, too. I took the time. You I know, took you time. took the time. <laughs> we reclaimed the time. because I mean, look, they didn't let me talk about Burberry earlier this week, but we'll get back to that. Really? Right. Say, now this is your show. Your platform. Well, let me tell you about the wellies at Burberry. No, we'll save that conversation. It is Christmas time. Yeah. All right, guys. We gotta leave it there. Miles, this Thanks, has been fun. Guys. You gotta join great. us again next after Friday. The holiday. We'll after, after the holiday. We're away next week. So. <laughs> all right. All right. We are, uh, we'll, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. We've got all your market action ahead. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The soft landing narrative taking shape on Wall Street is still uncertainty surrounding the growth of the U.S. economy, remaining a mixed picture following a fresh set of economic data this week showing that the labor market is rebalancing and pricing pressures cooling off just a bit. Holiday sales warnings from retailers, though, also emerged as a slew of companies reported earnings this week. Walmart, the nation's largest retailer, saying that deflation could be coming relatively soon. So what does all this mean for shoppers this holiday season? What does it mean more broadly speaking for the market? We want to bring in Ben Emmons, Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income and Macro at New Edge Wealth. Ben, it's good to see you here. So your takeaway from the action that we saw this week in terms of what we're hearing from the retailers and also the uh, new econ data that we got out that really started to, I think, sort of reinvigorate this conversation that we're starting to have about a soft landing being back in the picture. Yeah, I think that's entirely uh, the, the right way to describe it because... What happened with that CPI report was that we saw items like rent really breaking down, and that's about the pandemic. Finally, we're normalizing out of that shock. And, you know, Powell and the Fed have been saying, once that rent starts to decline, we, we really feel that we're getting on track towards the target. And I think that's what the market took on, saying, OK, Fed, you are, quote, unquote, done. You're not maybe cutting rates, but you definitely don't have to hike rates. So that was the first relief. And I think the second one was that if you get a Walmart CEO coming out and saying, hey, guess what, there's going to be deflation, that is a narrative that does struck a chord with markets. You know, of course, he's making, I think, a marketing campaign to get people in the store. <laughs> but I think for the bond market or the stock market, it was like deflation is something that you know, was from pre-pandemic. That was a risk at that time. Coming from a major you know, shock of inflation towards eventually a deflation, that's being discounted. And I think that's why you're seeing this major lift in markets. So based on the readings that we got this week, does that signal to you a, a, a Fed that is going to keep rates steady for the remainder of the year and, and potentially, based on from what we've heard from some economists, perhaps even think about a cut at the midpoint of next year, maybe later? So I think the framework is this, uh, that... So, yes, they, they don't have to necessarily hike in December, mm. bearing that there's not other data that's going to be suddenly surprising. Cause who knows, right? But and, and then the Fed has put out this idea to say, if we keep this funds rate at five and a half and the inflation continues to decline slowly, the Fed funds account for inflation is in the real rate gets higher, it starts to rise. Now, after the CPI report, I calculated that the funds rate went from 2% real to 2.25% real. Ironically, so the Fed gets actually more restrictive in real terms, and markets are lifting up. But for the Fed, this means that if they're getting a real rate, say, close to 3% next year, there's, quote, unquote, room for them to normalize that 5.5% funds rate, say, by 100 basis points or 50 basis points down. That's in their forecast now. I think that's likely. But it's the word normalization. That's what Daly put out there. That's what mm -hmm. Barkin put out there. It's not easing. They just simply say we have a restrictive rate that's high. We can normalize it a bit down, given that inflation is getting closer to the target. I think that's what markets understand. Um, and so it's not necessarily a negative, because if you were cutting rates quickly, that would mean you're in a downturn and you're getting a very different picture. So mm -hmm. I think, again, this is all playing into this current narrative in the markets, who knows, next year. But for the moment, for year end, that's very positive. Ben, what do you see the upside looking like from here? Because you have the S&P coming off its highest close since the beginning of September, the NASDAQ coming off its highest close since the beginning of August. Is there much room to move to the upside between now and year end? From a technical perspective, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Because there's this positioning out there that I think some of the other guests earlier spoke about, too, in stocks and bonds, there's still a fair bit of short positioning. And that pent-up covering of shorts, so to speak, uh, is, is really substantial. It can be the hundreds of billions of dollars. And it is all about sentiment, really. So if you're getting technical levels triggered, say on the 10-year, we're breaking below the four and a quarter, and on the S&P, we're breaking above 4,600, sort of that sort of ideas, you're getting suddenly this rush, and you get momentum players come in the market. So these are like hedge funds or these commodity trading advisors, CTAs, they call them. And I think that's all setting up for this year-end quote-unquote rally. Again, things could change. We could have other negative news come in. But technically speaking, it looks like that setup. Is a, a continuing resolution that we'll have to once again consider in <laughs> January and then again in February, is that part of kind of the negative considerations that are still on the table out there for the markets? Maybe not so much at this moment, uh, because I think what, what markets have concluded is like, no matter what happens in an election year, mm -hmm. we just cannot shut down the government. So it has no effect on the economy. 
But what is happening is that within Congress, as we talked last time, clearly there's a view developing, I think bipartisan view almost, like we do got to rein in the spending at some point. Right? We, we're just overspending. That will be the big change for the economy because a lot of the growth that we had this year was fueled by fiscal spending. I would say almost the majority of that, um, meaning aside from consumer spending, it was really the investments that we've made in the economy. But the strategic view of that is that it does lead to productivity gains that are picking up, and, and that's important, I think. So it's a bit of a delicate balance here. If they don't slash spending as much as they did back in 2011-12, we'll end up with an economy that's going to be stronger in next year, meaning no recession, 2 3% type growth rate. If they do get up, end up with this sequestration that you saw in 2011-12, and you're getting a very weak economy. I think given the election year, I think the former is the more outcome of a, of a stronger, like two, three percent economy. Interesting, Ben. Great to have you here yeah. with us. Thank Instead, you. Congratulations yeah. on. Yeah. Yes. We have been talking about this for weeks, if not months, leading up to the New York City Marathon. Your training. We had even done one of our our teases, our packages around that, and the <laughs> regiment that went into it. Congratulations on Thank finishing you. the race. Thank you very much. Absolutely, <laughs> Ben Emmons, who is the New Edge Wealth Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income. We appreciate you joining us here today. All right. Everyone, we also got to think about stocks rallying off cooler than expected economic data this week. We do. And it's telling one prominent Wall Street strategist that the market may be pricing in a soft landing. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, he's been thinking about this a lot and joins us now with the details. Brad, I've been thinking about it all day, all morning. I was actually thinking about it all yesterday, too, because wow. yesterday I, was, I attended virtually Goldman Sachs's media outlook or their outlook for 2024. And one thing that really caught my eye listening to him was sort of him highlighting, uh, David Costin, the head strategist there, highlighting the market action that we saw this week and essentially saying, well, this affirms what our economists have been talking about for months now, which is we're not going to go into recession. Mm. When you take a look at the market action this week, which you guys have been talking a lot about this hour, we saw the Russell 2000 skyrocket, right? One of the best days it's had in a year. We saw bond, year, bond yields fall, stocks overall rally, basically saying, okay, we're pricing in that soft landing. Now, sort of the second part of this story that I'm looking at as well is, of course, what if we're pricing in too much of a soft landing? And we've sort of been here before, and that was kind of an interesting twist to this story, too, when I think about what happens from here. When you talk to economists, remember back in February, markets had started pricing in maybe a soft landing, and then you had that January jobs report, 550,000 jobs added. Stock market goes down, and then the whole narrative shifts again, right? So that was something that economists have pointed out to me, sort of counter to that. What yeah. do you think about it? And Josh, you've been parsing through these notes. We certainly have gotten a lot of 2024 look-aheads this week in terms of what some of the other larger banks are expecting year going forward. How do you see Goldman's outlook, the fact that they see a very low risk of recession, stacking up to some of the other bigger players out there? Because there is a bit of a divide. There is a bit of a divide because Goldman sees the economic outlook being good, but they don't see that much of an upside in the S&P 500 when you really think about the call here. The call is 4,700. That's about 5%. It's less than 5% now. It's 5% when they wrote the note, but we've had this rally. And so their call is basically, we think the good news is priced into the market. And we're at a point where earnings are pretty much at a fair value. And we think things are going to be basically steady until the second half of the year. And that's the difference between Goldman's call and, say, a Morgan Stanley call is Goldman thinks that those rate cuts come at the end of the year because they don't see the economy going into recession. They see the economy doing well, and so they don't think the market really moves because the market wants certainty and the market's not going to move until we know what the Fed does. They don't think the market moves until the end of the year, which I don't think is necessarily consensus or the same thing we're hearing from all of these folks. It all comes down to those rate cuts, really. Yeah, absolutely. They do. All right, Josh Schaefer, thanks for stopping by. You got to come back again soon, right? <laughs> oh, on a Friday morning, yeah. to say the least. All right, guys, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith live in New York City. We are about 30 minutes into the trading day here. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now, starting with the major averages. They're searching for some direction today as investors hope to keep this week's gains going. We also see mixed quarterly results weighing on stocks a little bit here on the day's activity. All right, let's take a look at some of those individual movers. First up, big box retailer BJ is reporting a surprise drop in its third quarter same store sales and also cut its full year sales outlook. They cited quote, shifts in consumer behavior driven by macro headwinds. We're looking at losses of just about three and a half percent. Still, though, the retailer is saying that it is seeing an acceleration in membership growth and traffic. All right. Also tracking batteries. They seem to be running low for charge point here. The electric vehicle charging equipment maker announced weak preliminary third quarter results, as well as surprise changes in its C-suite. The company saw revenue fall short of expectations, citing pressure in its core North American and European markets. They also named former chief operating officer Rick Wilmer as its new CEO, as Pasquale Romano will step down from the role and into an advisor position. They also replaced their CFO without much explanation, but said that they are looking for a permanent person for the role. ChargePoint has received several analyst downgrades on this news. We're going to cover that just a little bit more later on. And Zoom seeing some relief after City upgraded the stock to neutral after keeping it at a sell rating for almost a year and a half. Now, City seeing a better balance between risks and potential rewards and also sees more usage, that usage becoming a bit more stable. But City, though, still remains a bit cautious as Zoom faces competition from Microsoft Teams, as well as high exposure to small and medium-sized businesses, which we know have a greater pro probability of discounting their accounts, discontinuing, excuse me, their accounts. All right, well, new residential construction data is out now with a surprise rise in starts and permits. Danny Romero joining us now with the numbers. Danny. Uh I think it's important to understand, Shauna, that permits lead starts and starts lead completions and completions lead sales. And the biggest takeaway in this report was there was a slight bump in multifamily permits. So really showing the renaissance in supply from the pandemic until now. There was a little bit of a slight drop in multifamily starts. Builders really respond to higher prices. And given the fact that asking rent has flattened, vacancies are rising, there has been some pullback when it comes to some of the projects for next year. And if we move over to single family, both permits and starts gained some momentum, but only slightly. And that really points out that builders are pretty much uh, finishing up their projects. There's still a lot of projects under construction right now. Yes, builders we are ramping up housing starts, but if we take a look at the smaller builder home builders, they're ramping up on a somewhat slower pace. The National Association of Home Builders says that they're forecasting a 5% increase in single family home starts that really does signal some sign of cautionary the momentum there. Now, UBS, I thought this was really interesting too. They are upping their forecast for housing starts for single family. They point out that the large public home builders really have some leverage and some skin in the game right now. The fact that there is such low supply on the existing home sales side. Another, it will be another story though for apartments there is pullback from developers. The fact that there has been so much supply that has been onto the market. So it, they really do signal that the market still needs to digest some of that supply. All right, Danny, we're going to continue to track some of these stocks closely annexed with this data that's come out this morning. Thanks so much for bringing that down. Yahoo Finance's own Danny Romero. Well, we heard from home builders on Thursday, their sentiment to decline for the fourth month in a row, but they showed some optimism for improved conditions in the coming months, saying they expect a 5% increase for single family starts in 2024 amid improving inflation data and the Fed holding rates here. Now, of course, a few things to continue to break down. And as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm continuing to track some of the home builder stocks out this morning. Pulte Group, that's seeing fractional move to the upside. You're also seeing Lennar and Toll Brothers try to hold on to some of the uh, small moves to the upside fractionally as they may be. Ultimately here, it's what price the consumer, the, the home buyers, the purchasers out there are comfortable with entering into a contract. And I think it's also important to note that even as we're listening into some of these earnings calls, 
important to pay attention to where you're actually seeing some of those contracts broken, even if there was uh, a, a potential kind of purchase that was brought on and, and into the backlogs for some of these home builders, Toll Brothers, Lenar, KB Homes, the list goes on. Uh, but at the end of the day, that signals how much more different the actual financing environment is for many of these home purchases right now. Yeah, clearly there's a lot of demand for housing starts, new homes to be built, because if you're out there, if you're looking for a home, if you're looking for a single family, multifamily, there are simply are not a lot of options out there on the market right now. So there clearly is on the demand side a need. Whether or not that's going to meet that demand, obviously there remains a wide gap, right? You just brought up a great point in terms of the lending environment right now, costing home builders a bit more. That's keeping them, uh, keeping their ambitions at least in check, just a bit. When it comes to this data that we got out this morning, housing starts, building permits, both surprising to the upside. You couple that with the fact that the median price of an existing home is less than 5% below that all-time high. Relief in home prices or any expectation that we could see a relief in home prices appears a long ways away. We had that demand, uh, demand obviously waning just a bit, but supply being such a massive issue here and a mass, uh, large gap still remains in terms of what is needed to be on the market in order to put uh, some more pressure on prices and seems like we're far ways away, at least for right now for that. Indeed, and it's all part of the inflation picture as well. In light of new economic data, investors are keeping an eye on what the Federal Reserve might do next. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schaumberger live in living color to discuss. <laughs> Jennifer, we haven't heard from too many Fed officials since the latest inflation number showed further progress, but this morning, two officials notably are speaking out. What do they say? Hey guys, good morning. It's so nice to be with you in studio here I in know. New York in the new digs. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we're finally hearing from some officials this morning. Uh, San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly actually speaking right now in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, she's warning that the Fed needs to move slowly to avoid a policy mistake. She's saying, quote, the perils of deciding too quickly are real. Declaring certainty too early is not just a missed forecast, it's a policy mistake. So so the doves are probably going to take this to say that, hey, the Fed should probably be done at this point. However, knowing President Daly, she's probably saying, hey, we really need to keep our options open, but continue moving slowly, which is really what we heard from Fed Chair Powell um, just last week. Now, we also heard from Boston Fed President Susan Collins. She's giving more of an academic speech as it relates to the job market, though she says that <clears throat> measuring the job market with the official aggregate unemployment rate may not actually be accurate if there are changes in the labor force participation rate. Now, she says if more people are joining the labor force when the job market is tight because they're trying to meet higher demand for workers, then that may not actually put upward pressure on inflation and cause the Fed to raise rates higher. So maybe taking from that, even though it's theoretical, that the Fed doesn't need to do more here? I don't know. Jen, how tough do you think this is, just towing that line, right? They want to sound positive. They want to reaffirm the fact that they do not think the economy is going to fall into recession. But they also are trying to not be too hawkish and spook the markets just a bit. From your interpretation, has the rhetoric at all significantly changed from what we've been hearing from policy officials more recent, or I guess over the last two or three months? So I think they are really trying to toe that line, yeah. like you said. It's a very cautious walk here. Wall Street is really looking for them to say, hey, we've reached the peak, but Fed Chair Powell and many of these officials are trying to keep their options open, right? Yeah. They have not taken rate hikes off the table, even though the markets are now pricing in rate cuts as soon as May. I think, though, that they're going to be here higher for longer. So I think that the, the thought that they're going to begin cutting in May may be a bit of a misnomer because, yes, you're seeing progress on the inflation front. You got that great CPI number last week coming after the PCE number, but you also still have a strong job market and you still have a ways to go to get back to the 2% inflation number. Yes, the Fed's going to have to cut before they actually get to 2%. Otherwise, they will make a policy mistake, but we're not there yet. Is there the belief that higher for longer can also equal soft landing as well? I think it's possible if the job market remains strong. And to uh, Colin's point, um, you know, we don't see more inflationary pressures and people keep spending. But I think the key ingredient there is going to be productivity. Mm -hmm. And that's what Austin Goolsbee spoke to earlier this week. And that's what many economists have been telling me, that the only way to really describe an economy that remains strong, a job market that remains strong, with inflation coming down, is productivity, which we really haven't seen come up in years. So that 
that would be very welcome. At the same time, of course, you've got supply chain issues that are now finally being rebalanced. That's been part of this as well. we'll just lather my OS with some uh, AI and we'll have plenty of productivity <laughs> here yeah. on set. All right, Jen, it's great to have you in the studio. Thank Thanks so, so much, much for coming up. with you. All right, well, consumers appearing to be taking their foot off the discretionary gas pedal as they are focused more on buying essentials. But what does that mean for this holiday season? Well, according to travel booking site Hopper, this year is expected to be the busiest holiday travel season in at least four years with the average domestic round trip airfare around Thanksgiving costing consumers about $268. That's off about 10% from what consumers were paying last year. So let's bring in Hopper lead economist Haley Berg to discuss that and more. Haley, so when you see a drop in airfare prices, you obviously would think demand is going to rise, but it's a tough environment right now. Many consumers are pulling back on some of those discretionary purchases. How do you see that affecting holiday travel? We're still expecting a very busy holiday season. If anything, the prices we're seeing now, not just for Thanksgiving, but also Christmas, are a good sign for consumers in terms of their ability to fit in those trips home for the holidays. We're still seeing strong demand, expecting about 15% more passengers to be flying over Thanksgiving, very similar number for Christmas. So hopefully the price relief we're seeing will enable travelers to get in those holiday trips with a little bit of money to spare compared to last year where prices were incredibly high coming off of a very expensive summer travel. Is it is it price relief over the same kind of travel days? And I, I asked that specifically kind of looking at the, if you were traveling, say, the day before or two days before Thanksgiving, that might be more expensive than traveling the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And perhaps some consumers out there might be playing with the toggles a little bit more here to try and figure out what the best days to travel are. Have you seen any massive shift in what that time span is looking like? We've definitely seen a shift in those most popular dates to travel. It's small, but it's there. And it's not just driven by price sensitivity, but definitely some incremental flexibility travelers have now in a more remote work fo focused workplace. So though Tuesday and Wednesday next week and Sunday will be the busiest days to travel to and from Thanksgiving, we're also seeing a high volume of travelers departing today, tomorrow, Sunday and Monday for Thanksgiving. And we expect to see the same at Christmas. So increased flexibility definitely is one of the drivers of of why people are traveling on some of these alternate dates. But price is another driver. We recommend at Hopper travelers to fly on those less lower demand dates to get the lowest prices. You can save about 20 to 40% off your airfare if you go on one of those low demand dates. So it's a great way to optimize your budget. Haley, in terms of where people are booking, where they're heading this holiday season, how does that compare to some of the trends that you saw last year? Thanksgiving is a very domestic focused holiday. So we're seeing big cities, New York, Orlando, Los Angeles, those are most popular. We're also seeing Caribbean, those more regional, short international flights are popular. But on the whole, the biggest shift from last year to this year is more of a focus on international travel. It's more accessible this year. Prices have come down considerably from last year, especially for those warm weather destinations. So we'll definitely be seeing more passengers grabbing their passports this Thanksgiving season. I mean, look, I, I have some uh, some family that's from the Caribbean. I, we might need to move Thanksgiving celebrations there in the future. It sounds like uh, that's a, that's a popping destination party in the Caribbean. Anyway, as we continue to think about what this spells out going into next year, some some of these year-over-year -year comps are going to be particularly interesting to figure out if we see kind of normalization in prices, because if we're kind of looking back to the CPI data even that came out this week, there was some moderation lower in the airfare prices. Do we expect that to continue? We do. Right now, domestic prices have reached what we're considering a normal level coming out of the pandemic, and we expect them to stay that way into 2024. The biggest shift we hope to see next year is on those international routes. Think Europe and Asia, top two regions for American travelers. Prices have seen relief, but we need to see more. A lot of that relief will come from higher supply, especially on the Trans-Pacific routes. Airlines are still rebuilding there. But really, we expect domestic prices to stay low for consumers and hope to see more relief on the international fares. Haley, what does the timing look like in terms of some of that relief that you're hoping to see for international routes? 
good news is we're already seeing it take European flights, for example, down to about seven or eight hundred dollars round trip now compared to over fourteen hundred dollars this summer. We expect that continue into next year. The linchpin for Asia is going to be adding back capacity, airlines adding more flights. Right now, that's the biggest driver of high prices. That's uh, compounded a bit by higher jet fuel prices. But on the whole, we need to see more capacity added back on those routes, especially into China, in order to see prices come down. Right now, airfare to Tokyo, for example, over $1,400. Typically, we would see that closer to about a thousand. So we're looking for pretty major price relief, but I would estimate that we'll see that by the end of 2024 if that capacity can come back. Just lastly, while we have you here, I mean, this is without a massive resurgence in, in corporate travel. If we do see uh, like uh, just a jolt of corporate travel re-enter into the equation, how, how much could that actually not uh, or, or kind of keep some of these airline prices from actually moderating lower as, as we've been talking about for much of this conversation, knowing that if corporate travel just has to get there, then they're just going to pay what they need to. Absolutely. We've seen a slow resurgence of corporate travel since mid to late 2021. And it's really been a story of slow and steady compared to leisure travel, which came back with a vengeance at the beginning of last year. If we saw a dramatic shift in corporate travelers suddenly picking up travel in 2024, it could put some upward pressure on prices. But more than anything, I think we'd see those business and first class selling out faster. So probably pushing more consumers towards premium and main cabin. That would not put as much upward pressure, especially on those longer haul international routes. But I believe what we're hearing from airlines now is depending on the routes, Corporate travel can be back as much as 80%. So there isn't all that much more to grow. But if we do see a big surge, could impact prices in some of those higher cabin classes, where right now a lot of leisure travelers are booking. Those business travelers come back. There'll be more competition. All right, Haley Berg, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for joining us here. Hopper's lead economist. Thanks, Haley. Great being with you. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. $2.4 trillion in options are set to expire today, and bullish bets could push stocks even higher in the days ahead. Here to break it all down is Jared Blickery. Jared.
Memories of 2021, let me break this down. You said 2.4 trillion, that is a fact. Uh, this morning, 1 trillion expired on the open. That's because index, uh, index options, most of them anyway, they expire on the open of the market. Now, in the afternoon, we're gonna have options on ETFs, on futures, on single stocks. Those are going to be the PM ones. So this afternoon, PM, we got 1.4 trillion. And the way this breaks down is the S&P 500 index and all its derivatives and ETFs, 1.66 trillion on them. And then NASDAQ and Russell indices at another 320 billion, single stocks 430 billion. Why all this focus on what's going on in the options market? Because it has exploded recently, especially when we take a look at small caps. IWM, for instance, and options on that have just exploded this week. Now, this is a, a Forgive all the squiggly lines here, but there is a point. This goes back five years, and this shows the put call skew out one month in the options market. What I want you to focus on here is just that when it comes to IWM, that's the small caps, we are at a record low, at least with respect to this data set, which is by Goldman Sachs, and the other indices, those are heading down as well. So this favors that call buying uh, that forces options dealers to hedge their bets by buying the underlying stock. And when times are good, this is a virtuous cycle and uh, prices explode to the upside. This is something we've seen, especially with respect to the mega caps and a lot of growth stocks this year. And I can illustrate this just by showing you what's happened to the NASDAQ 100. Here's a year to date look. And uh, I said recollections and memories of 2021, because back in the day, that was a huge strategy, just buying call options one day to prior expiration, basically picking up little lottery tickets and betting that prices would always go up. Of course, that ended in tears for many, and it took months and months and months of it not, not working to drain bank accounts. But nevertheless, kind of a resurgence of that activity. So all in all, going to be a really interesting day to watch this. By the way, just to dispel one common myth, we don't actually see more volatility on options expiration date, especially in the indices. Sometimes you see it in individual stocks, but for the most part, everything kind of balances out and we actually see lower volatility on these days, guys. And actually, we're going to throw it back to Diane King Hall, who has just joined us. Yep, I've got the latest on retirement. Thanks so much for you, uh, from you, Jared. All right, the state of retirement income has been a topic of debate recently. Popular finance radio host Dave Ramsey recently recommended that retirees invest 100% of their assets in equities. He typically recommends mutual funds and withdraw 8% per year of the portfolio starting value. But is this the right move for everyone? Morningstar suggests that we have reached the highest safe starting withdrawal rate for retirees this year. That's 4%. It's an old maxim. Here with the details is John Reckenthaler, Morningstar's vice president of research. So, John, thanks so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get into the latest. So last year, if you followed that rule, it didn't really work. What makes it work now? Um, depends. Well, last year... Uh, I wouldn't say it didn't work. I um, uh, people were, if people spent 3.8 percent of their portfolio, which was the number that we recommended last year, their portfolio went down. But it is rebounding quite a bit this year. At least, uh, at least the equities have. I mean, it's a long-term strategy. When we put, come up with a number like this, it's a it's a third it's a forecast for a 30-year time horizon, and what the number means is. That, for example, this year with 4%, we're saying somebody can withdraw 4% from their portfolio at the start of their retirement with a 30 year, healthy 30 year time horizon. And each year, so that would be, say, on a, on a million dollar portfolio, $40,000. And each year that it can increase, they keep, they can increase that $40,000 amount by uh, the level of inflation. So it's inflation adjusted as with, say, Social Security payments. Um, and that's an important feature of, of these calculations to understand is we do intend to maintain the purchasing power of investors. So it comes and goes. Last year was a was a tough year for anybody who started to retire. But this year certainly has been much better. So for those people who did start to retire yet last year and didn't do as well, there's always, with regard to that, or even people retiring now, because people are living longer, the worry about outliving their money. What do you say to that with your base assumptions in this latest research? Well, the important thing to understand is we're, uh, you know, we have a conservative approach when we're forecasting and saying, okay, people can spend 
this year it was four percent, four percent of their of their nest eggs. For one, that's over a thirty year time horizon. So that's pretty long. If somebody's sixty five years old, even with longer lifespans today, that's taking you out to ninety five. Second thing is, for the most part, people aren't spending as much money when they're 95 years old as when they first retire. They don't have as much energy. They're not doing as many things. And, and the third is, in most cases, because we, we build this to have a 90% success rate, according to our simulations, in most cases, there's quite a bit of money left over at the end of the pool, at the end of the period. So should people live longer, uh, they can do so. Of course, one can also supplement that by doing something like buying annuity, a lifetime annuity, which would be additional protection for living longer. So, so what, what is the balance that investors then should have in there when you're thinking about retirement portfolios, whether it's a traditional IRA, Roth IRA, or 401k, especially when you look at what the data suggests about how much people have? I mean, the average balance that when I looked earlier this year, or the last data for earlier this year was in six figures, and it wasn't necessarily in the high six figures. This was the average. And when you think about the cost of living in general, what should the balance of people's portfolios be to protect for the future? Well, the balance certainly d does depend upon what lifestyle they want when they're retired and how much income that they have. Uh, I mean, I threw out that million dollar number. That's not a bad number to try to achieve. It'd be a very difficult number for somebody who's uh, a lower wage worker and not so difficult for somebody who's a uh, you know professional and contributing into a, say a 401k plan for many years and that would be forty thousand dollars in today's money again and we would assume that you can continue that purchasing power throughout retirement to supplement social security but of course that issue is a uh, in a sense it's it's a bit of a foregone conclusion with our report since we're projecting what people who have retired or are retiring and and are at that point could do going forward. So what happened in the past is what happened in the past. Mm. All right, we will have to leave our conversation there. I'm certain we'll get to this topic again throughout uh, the days ahead. John Reckenthaler, Morningstar's Vice President of Research. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Diane. You got it. Bye. We've got more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
All things housing continue to be really one of the hottest topics on Yahoo Finance with good reason. Mortgage rates are finally off their peak, perhaps enticing some folks to get back in to the housing market. Let's welcome in Varun Krishna, CEO of Rocket Companies. Varun, I should say the new CEO of Rocket Companies, you just started, what, a couple weeks ago. Early observations on the job. Thank you for having me, Brian. Great to be on the show. Um, it's been an amazing transition. You know, I really appreciate uh, the experiences that I'm having so far. I'm learning a lot, spending time with our team members, getting to know the business, getting to know the culture, and I'm having a blast. How is it different? You're a product guy. Uh, yeah. How are you seeing the business differently than, let's say, someone who had that really robust experiences in all things mortgages, let's say? Yeah, you know, I think, I think first off, you know, the mortgage business is one of those businesses that I felt like was always ripe for disruption uh, from a technology approach. And so when you think about where we're at now with the inflection point that artificial intelligence is bringing, um, the product person in me is constantly looking for ways that we can build an awesome product, an awesome user experience, something that is simple, that's fast, that creates certainty. And so uh, when I looked at the overall experience, obviously Rocket is world class at what it does today but I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible tomorrow when you especially think about the role that AI and data play in the journey. And you spent a lot of time at Intuit, right? That's right. Intuit's a company we know here very well through the lens, often speaking with uh, CEO Sasan Godarzi. What did you learn from that operation that you're applying here? You know, I think the, the biggest thing that I learned from, uh, from Intuit was really just um, customer and client obsession. You know, really directly observing uh, your clients and customers, falling in love with the problems that they face, and then thinking broadly about how you can solve those problems in durable ways. Um, that is something that I'm, I'm very grateful for from a learning perspective from my Intuit time. Uh, one of the hottest stories really on our site right now is the fact that mortgage rates have now started to back up off the peaks of around 8% to 30 year, of course, down for three straight weeks. What has that caused in your business? What are some trends you can call out? I think we're certainly seeing um, some momentum as a result of just some of the recent uh, rate pressure relief. Um, and also, if you look at some of the forecasts, if you look at what, uh, what the MBA is project projecting, what the Treasury is projecting, as well as the analysts, um, there's a good chance that we expect some rate pressure uh, going into next year, you know, up to maybe up to 150 basis points, which is massive. And that's going to be great. You know, you have a lot of consumers who have been on the sidelines, um, a lot of pent up demand. I mean, people still want to buy and sell homes. So the demand is there. And I think this will be a great opportunity for folks to kind of jump into the business and the, uh, of, buying, of buying a home. I think the other thing that is also um, really interesting is even for folks who have purchased this past year, you know, the, that rate pressure relief is also going to be an opportunity to save some money and refinance. And so uh, I think we're going to see some good things in this next year. The momentum that you mentioned, is it being driven by millennials? And I ask that because housing affordability, is, it's still tough. Yeah. I, I'm... I'm an aging millennial, and a lot of my friends, they don't, they don't have the money still to get a home. Yeah. You know, I think uh, one of the great things is, you know, I read an article the other day that talked about how, you know, 65% of Gen Zers actually want to buy a home in the next five years. Uh, the unfortunate thing is the journey is going to be one that's filled with friction. And that's why we, we really focus on technology you know, as we think about Rocket. How can we make the home buying experience more frictionless? How can we make it faster? How can we add certainty? How can we create value? Um, I think what's great is you know you have a, a generation now that has um, the ability to unlock significant wealth um, with this just sheer size of the population, and so um, we're very excited to take a more technology-centric approach to the home ownership experience, as we've always done, but in particular, you know, with that new population. I want to talk a lot about some of the the AI initiatives you have uh, because I do view you guys now as a fintech play. Let's say rates, interest rates, stay where they are. Uh, maybe come down in mid to summer, mid of the next year into the summer. What does that mean for industry origination volume? Do you think it goes over 1.3 trillion? Because I know that's, that's yeah. the key bogey for a lot yeah. of analysts on the street. Well, you know, the, the great thing about the mortgage business is it is a huge total addressable market. I mean, even now, the mortgage market is around 2 trillion. If you think about mortgage plus real estate, financial services that surround, that gets up to 5 trillion. And you know, there's no player that has more than a single digit market share. In fact, the top 50 uh, providers make up only 38% of the total market. So it is a massive, massive market. And that's why you know, our focus is really on growth. You know, how do we grow our share? How do, we, how do we take share from our competitors? How do we do that by creating a more disruptive and delightful experience, um, independent of where the rates are? You know, the market will be the market. Uh, in terms of AI, 
spring buying season 2024, do you have AI initiatives on the table that we will, will be able to see and how does that change the, the experience for people? Yeah, you know, I would say absolutely. Um, we've actually been experimenting with um, AI technology for years. Uh, we have a platform that we call Rocket Logic. It's our proprietary in-house loan origination system. Um, we've been testing that out this past year with our mortgage banking team as well as our, our underwriting team. We have thousands of people that are actually using this. And what it does is it simplifies the home ownership experience. You know, when you think about the, the journey, um, you know, for a client, you have to go through lead generation, mortgage banking, underwriting, closing, servicing, appraisal, title. I already don't want to buy a home. There's a ton I'm of stress. I'm just going to stay in my one bedroom. I mean, There's a ton of stress. And, and the way we think about it is, you know, AI is actually a perfect, um, is a perfect solution for many of these processes because you can take data, you can automate it. You can take knowledge and you can codify it. You can leverage things like natural language processing and automation to remove friction from the experience. So we, we have Rocket Logic. We've had that in play for the last year. We're continuing to innovate. We've got some big things, but we're already seeing some benefits. You know, we've seen a 20% increase uh, reduction in turn time. So the process of getting through the loan much, much faster. We've also seen a 20% reduction in human touches because of that automation. Uh, and I will tell you that we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And you're having an, when's that investor day? You have an investor day coming up? We are, we are. We'll announce more in the coming months, but we are gonna have an investor day. Look forward to seeing you there. Okay, all right, so a year from now, how is your platform, how is that experience different than it is today? You know, I think we're, the way we're thinking about it is we are applying AI to every aspect of the experience. The, the experiences that our clients face when they come to rocketmortgage.com, to the experience they have to uh, make it easier to provide their data and their documents, to the experiences that our team members use when they engage our clients, you know, taking calls, automatic call scripting, um, simplifying underwriting, making that more autonomous and then giving clients more certainty in the process with better communication, better transparency, and ultimately hyper-personalization. And so um, the technology is moving fast. You know, we're investing, we're increasing our velocity, we're doubling down. Um, we expect to continue to have some pretty big releases over the next uh, over the next uh, 12 months. All right, well, we look forward to continuing to uh, follow your journey. Maybe the next time uh, we talk, maybe I'll have a down payment on a home. I'm clear. I, I don't know. Maybe not. Varun Krishna, uh, the new CEO of Rock Companies. We appreciate you uh, coming out of the office. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thanks so much. Cheers. And our thanks to Brian for that interview. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
News out of the EV space is not so supercharged this morning as ChargePoint shares plummet over its preliminary third quarter results and some leadership shakeups. Roth MKM also downgraded the stock to neutral from buy and slashed its price target to $2, saying that there's material deterioration and it wasn't the only one. Needham also came out with a call this morning, slashing its price target to $4 from $8. They still interestingly maintained their buy rating on this. But as we continue to really dive into what's taking place over at ChargePoint, it comes at the same time that you've got a host of companies that and auto manufacturers that have decided to make their own move over to the NAC the North American Charging Standard, Lucid, Fisker, Ford, GM, BMW, Hyundai, all of those that have announced those ambitions. And that certainly kind of shakes up the network model that, that ChargePoint was really looking to build out as well. Certainly does. We know that this is an industry that's been under pressure now for quite some time. ChargePoint, which is largely viewed as one of the leaders within this industry, now showing even more signs of stress here. We're seeing it reflected in the stock price. Ahead of this report, shares were down about two thirds. Now they're selling off another 30 and so percent here on the day. When you take a look at some of these issues, you mentioned the fact the competition from Tesla, and obviously that has been the big driver here in this story over the last several months, signing more and more automakers onto its charging standard, really disrupting the industry and forcing some of these other players like ChargePoint to adapt. I think also one of the reasons why we're seeing such a reaction in the stock here this morning was this executive change. It came as a bit of a surprise here to the street. TD Cowan was out with a no or out with reaction here to this, saying that these big changes, they did not see them coming. When it comes to exactly what they are replacing, the CEO, the CFO, the two chop jobs, so a real shift here in executives for the company, which could pretty vastly change the direction of the company here going forward. I think a lot of questioning what exactly the future holds for ChargePoint for some of its other rivals out there. Its market cap now, just around a billion dollars, and it was peaking at just over $11 billion just around two years ago, so a massive slide in shares, just around two bucks a share, obviously something that we need to keep an eye on. And we're seeing real weakness across the sector. Yeah, one of the SPAC stories that, of course, we had tracked early on in its life as a publicly traded entity, thanks to the DSPAC that took place. And at the end of the day, some of the numbers as well that the company had put out there, they were looking for, and the street was looking for, $150 million at the low end of the guidance range. $150 million to $165 million was that range there. Ultimately, ChargePoint came out and said that third quarter sales actually going to fall closer to between $108 million on the low end, top end, $113 million. So the street not liking that at all today. All right. Well, we're less than a week to Thanksgiving. Yeah. So let's talk some turkey. Thanks to easing pricing pressures here, the price of your turkey is dropping this year. It's going to cost significantly less. Now, according to Wells Fargo, turkey prices are down about 16% from a year ago. And speaking of turkey, Butterball, the company that produces poultry products, releasing its Thanksgiving report for the year, finding that 79% of consumers are expected to purchase a whole turkey and 81% of people are set to buy the same size or larger turkey than last year. We want to bring in Butterball CEO Jay Jandrain to talk a little bit more about some of the trends that you're seeing right now and also maybe give us some tips on some of the people for some of the people who are cooking their turkeys this year. But Jay, what are you seeing in terms of demand and pricing, how it compares to last year? Well, demand is strong, which is great. We're seeing uh, certainly a re uh, return to uh, bigger celebrations, uh, talking to our consumers uh, pre-holiday. Uh, we know that they're happy to get back out and uh, celebrate this uh, Thanksgiving with friends and family like they haven't maybe done so in the last couple of years. So it's, uh, it's great to see that people are getting kind of back to normal again and looking for uh, bigger gatherings, which means they're they're going to be probably looking for a little bit bigger turkey. Most of the folks that we talked to are say that they're going to buy the same or larger turkey this year as they did last year, which makes sense because of bigger gatherings. Uh, and demand is strong, and, and fortunately, there's a great supply out there, so there's plenty of turkey for everybody uh, for this Thanksgiving. I want to ask you about that supply. I mean, we are on pace to see the hottest year on record, according to some of the climatologists that we've spoken with, some of the scientists out there. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because this can directly impact the, the turkey industry and for Butterball. How have you been able to navigate that and ensure that the, there are turkeys that, I guess, grimly make it to the Thanksgiving table? 
Well, we, we start planning the, the next holiday right after this one is done. So we've got a year of, of time that we're really building that inventory and making sure that we've got plenty of supply uh, in the freezer. And then, of course, we produce a fresh product just shortly before uh, Thanksgiving. But uh, if there are little bumps in the road, most of the time there's opportunity to kind of work those through without any challenges. Uh, but a lot of planning and effort goes into that, uh, certainly uh, with our company and then with the rest of the industry to make sure that we've got enough product on the table for, for consumers. Jay, have you noticed any sort of shift in terms of how people are shopping, what they're spending on, how many people they're going to have gathered around their Thanksgiving table this year? Yeah, we're, we're expecting about nine, average about nine people around the table this year. And that, those numbers are certainly up. You know, with COVID, uh, people weren't able to get together like they normally would in the past. So these are really kind of back to pre-pandemic numbers, which is which is great. Uh, it, you know, as far as uh, the consumer right now, uh, certainly inflation is top of mind. And, and uh, that's when we talk to these customers, uh, our consumers, uh, they're telling us that. And they, that's certainly something they're paying attention to. The great news really is, as you mentioned, your know, prices are down this year, which is good to see, helps the consumer out certainly. Uh, and it's also really a very economical meal because of the heavy feature activity, the heavy sales prices uh, uh, that uh, retailers are uh, putting the product out uh, to consumers at, uh, it really makes it a, a you know very cost-effective meal when you look at the grand scheme of things. Uh, and uh, it certainly helps at this time when people are really having to watch their dollars. And that makes it more costly if you burn the turkey at the end of the day, Jay. Mm -hmm. So what are you telling some of the buyers of Butterball Turkey out there who are trying to figure out, all right, what should I be doing? Should I be baking this turkey? Should I be, I've heard of people frying the turkey. Should I be, you know, making sure that if I've got a smoker that I'm smoking it the correct way? What's the Butterball CEO preferred way to enjoy Thanksgiving turkey? Well, particularly for uh, someone who's hosting for the first time, or maybe they haven't done it very often, uh, baking it is the best way to go. It's about as foolproof as it can be. And of course, a butterball turkey in that oven is going to come out just perfect every time, no matter what. But if they want to get a little more adventurous or, or they have just uh, a little uh, need some help in making sure they know how to get the, the meal done, uh, they need to call our talk line. You know, we've got uh, folks at our turkey talk line have been doing it for 42 years. There's about 50 of them that are just experts in this, and they're going to talk anybody through any challenges that they may have for the year, whether it's cooking tips, how to carve it, uh, ideas on different seasonings and, and uh, ways to make it a little bit special. Uh, but those folks are fantastic, and they're there to help anybody with any needs they have. Jay, I hosted my first Thanksgiving last year, and I got to say, it did reference Butterball for some of the tips because I was very nervous cooking my first turkey. Jay, for those out there who are hosting this year or they're responsible for bringing the turkey, when should they be buying or how far ahead should they be reserving their turkeys? Well, like I said, fortunately this year there's no issues with supply, uh, but we do always tell people to get out a little bit earlier. If you've got a particular size you want to get, depending on the size of the gathering, getting out a little earlier is better just to make sure that your store has the size you're looking for at that moment. Um, you know, at this point now, we're, we're less than a week away from Thanksgiving, so hopefully they've made their purchase. But if not, uh, I'm sure there's product in the stores right now that they, they can get to and, and uh, make sure that they've got a, a, a the turkey on their uh, table this Thanksgiving. Jay, you know, we've got this headline that's just come across from from an interview that that looks like it happened, um, at least on broadcast. Kelly Clarkson's show had Martha Stewart on, the, the famed, of course, U.S. chief home economist, if you will, uh, unelected as it may be. At the same time, huge food influencer. She's throwing in the towel on Turkey. What does what goes through your mind when you hear something like that, when you've got such a large influencer who gets a lot of people excited about what they're putting in the oven, what they're cooking, that is giving up on turkey. Well, you know, I saw that uh, news report yesterday as well. Now, it did also go on to say, I think Martha said she's already cooked like 14 turkeys already this year. That's a lot. So she's, she's, <laughs> she's done her share. We certainly appreciate that. Uh, love what Martha has done for the holidays and for, for uh, throwing a party. Uh, so I, maybe she's just a little tired right now because of 14 turkeys. We'll cover a little grace, and uh, I'm sure she'll be back uh, in the fold next year. Anybody would be tired after 14 turkeys. Pass the gravy to somebody else. Put that on them. Right. Jay Jandrin, who is the Butterball CEO. Jay, appreciate the time here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Absolutely. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Well, that's it. We've got much more coming up in our next hour, though, during the 11 a.m. We're wrapping up Healthcare Week here at Yahoo Finance. Our very own Anjali Kamlani sitting down with Amazon Pharmacy's chief medical officer to chat about the tech giant's big investment in healthcare. And what goes up must come down maybe eventually here. Mortgage rates, at least for right now, falling for the third week. So is now the time to jump in and buy a house? We'll discuss. Plus, don't call it a comeback. The Toyota Prius earned top honors as Motor Trend's 2024 Car of the Year. Why is this Prius worthy of the top honor? We'll get the answer to that question next. Can't wait for that. All right, let's do a quick check of the markets here. 90 minutes into the trading day. So looking at a bit of a mixed picture. The S&P just at the flat line, actually. The Dow off about 15 points. And NASDAQ off about a tenth of a percent, taking a breather from the rally that we've seen over the last several trading days. All right, well, that does it for us today on Yahoo Finance. Akiko Fujita, Rochelle Kufo have you for the next hour. We'll see you Monday.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akika Fujita with Rochelle Akufo. We are wrapping up a busy week of retail earnings. Gap is the latest company expecting caution around the holiday shopping season. After retail sales declined for the first time in seven months, we're going to take a look at where folks are still spending. Plus, investors are keeping their fingers crossed for a dovish pivot from the Fed. Inspired by this week's softer economic data, yields are dropping to two-month lows. So what does this all mean for the housing market? We'll discuss next. And Amazon's big pharma bet. From telehealth to medication delivery, Yahoo Finance can be sitting down with Amazon Pharmacy's chief medical officer to talk about the tech giant's major investments in the space. But first, let's take a look at where markets are trading 90 minutes into the trading day on this Friday. A pretty flat day so far. We've got the Dow down 31 points, the S&P 500 trading flat there and the Nasdaq down 16. We should mention, despite those red arrows, all three major indices right now on pace to round out the week on a positive note. In terms of sectors we're watching today, energy seeing the biggest bounce back on the day. We call it a bounce back because we have seen those prices really pull back earlier in the week on the back of that inventory glut. Uh, the data that came out there, but the energy sector up about 1.6% there, consumer staples and tech down just slightly. Uh, we should mention treasury yields as well as uh, seeing pushing higher, uh, at least on the shorter end, five-year yield at 446, as is the 10-year, the 30-year yield at 461, Rochelle. Well, is the narrative of this resilient consumer still valid? We got quite a bit of data this week from the government, as well as retailers that pointed to significant slowdowns now and to come. So let's start with that retail sales data, Akiko. It dipped for the first time in months, down 0.1% in October here. I mean, we, we've been talking about the sort of, you know, the, the softness of the consumer, but then we also saw it starting to appear in some of these earnings calls as well. But I mean, still falling by, still falling, but by less than expected. So this narrative of, of the still strong consumer still materializing here, despite student debt repayments kicking back in, still high interest rates. And, you know, a lot, a lot of this, uh, the pandemic savings money, that's long gone. And we're looking at a trillion dollars of credit card debt. Yet here's, here's the consumer still willing to spend. Yeah, all things considered, resilience still there. But Rochelle, it's kind of worth backing up to give a broader context here, I think, because we're talking so much about retail, particularly this week, not just because of the earnings, but because consumer spending itself makes up about 70 percent of the economy. So how the retailers perform, how the consumer is, matters a lot to the economy. And to your point, Rochelle, the, the narrative going into this earnings season largely was that the consumer was resilient. That's still partly the case, but we also started to hear this week, particularly some from some of the big box retailers, that the cracks are starting to form, that consumers are becoming a little more cautious going into the holiday season. And then we also heard from the likes of Walmart this word about choiceful, that consumers are maybe holding off a little before they make that purchase. Yes, they've been pulling back on some of the discretionary spending, but even when you talk about clothes, they're not getting ahead of the season to buy up in advance. They are waiting a little longer. And so the sales, even though a company like Walmart is still pretty well positioned, um, it's starting to look a little more uneven, Rochelle. No, yeah, I mean, and you raise a good point here. All retail certainly not created equal, as we've seen so far this earnings season. I mean, even as we look at what we saw with Macy's there, I mean, investors were impressed with Macy's. I mean, earnings beat the street, better than expected same store sales, even for the full year projecting a better than fair decline of up to 7%, an improvement of its previous estimate of a 7.5% of a drop at most. There were things to like. They did a better job at managing their inventory than, say, a, a Target, some, some of these other companies, which means that they're more responsive now. If, if there's a change in consumer trends, they're able to be more responsive here. They've also been investing a lot in, you know, not as much heavy discounting because of that better inventory management, not subject to the same sort of discounting that they suffered from last year. So be a better look for margins as well. Also investing in their CapEx spend, better digital technology, supply chain modernization. Something I was looking at, though, is shrink, something that was an issue last earnings season. We saw from Target CFO still seeing it growing year over year, but moderating a little bit in the third quarter. So it's still a significant financial headwind, as he mentioned there, but at least not at the forefront as it has been.
Yeah, and Rochelle, you know, so much of the stock moves that we've seen on the back of these results haven't necessarily been about the results, but the outlook as well. And investors looking ahead to see just how strong that holiday season is going to look. You talked about how Macy's reported TJX, a discount store, yes, one of those that came out particularly strong in terms of the outlook, raising the full year guidance for the third time this year. Uh, the company talking about consumers seeking those discounts, being a little more selective about what they buy. And you could argue they're more well positioned to capitalize on some of that weaker sentiment and the glut of inventory that, remember, still trickling through from some of the larger retailers. Uh, one thing that kind of caught my eye, at least when it comes to TJX, you were just talking about Macy's. They've talked about softer sales in things like apparel as well as home goods. That was the opposite of what we saw from TJX, which, of course, includes names like Marshalls as well as TJ Maxx. So that sort of points to that cautious consumer, maybe you could argue a smarter consumer, seeking out those discounts in this environment. It's true. I mean, you consider after the spending spree consumers went on in the summer with concert tickets and this and that, looking ahead to, you know, perhaps that, that holiday spending coming home to roost, being a lot more cautious than they perhaps usually would be. Well, let's continue this discussion. Will Jack Frost send a chill over this holiday shopping season? Retailers and consumer staples companies have been warning of a slowdown in consumer spending in their recent quarterly reports. Here is some insight into where consumers are spending. Is Nick Modi, RBC Capital Markets Managing Director. Good to have you on the show here. So I want to first start with, with non-discretionary, the sort of the needs that consumers have right now. What are you seeing in terms of how they're spending there and what they're trading down and some of the patterns? the leaders in this space yeah it's it's an interesting thing i mean we, we've been kind of flagging a deteriorating consumer backdrop since actually late last year uh because we were seeing a lot of uh movement and evidence within the marketplace at least with the companies that we've been covering so it's not like co uh consumers are cutting back entirely on consumer goods or consumer staples consumption what they're doing and i think walmart's phrase of choiceful is very appropriate they are being very choiceful. They still want that candy bar, but they're buying a smaller size. They still want that um, beverage alcohol product or spirits, but they're going to 750 milliliters versus the one and a half liter. So we're seeing a lot of pack size downgrade. Uh, we are seeing private label shares pick up in many categories across the consumer goods space. Um, and in some instances, we're seeing consumers just make choices. I mean, we, we did a report recently where there are consumers that are literally skipping meals. Uh, and, so you're, and so you're seeing that impact the packaged food space. And that raises the question, Nick, as we go into the holiday, the holiday season, what this means for some of the other retailers, smaller compared to Walmart. If Walmart and Target are talking about more discounting going into December, what are some other names that, that you'll be watching for to, to get a real pulse on just how far the consumer is willing to go in this environment? Yeah. So, you know, one thing that we like to look at, especially during the holiday season, is uh, the beauty companies, right? Uh, obviously, beauty uh, fragrance in particular is a very popular gift item during the holiday season. But it tends to be on the mu on much more of the defensive end of what you would call discretionary consumption, right? So it tends to get impacted less than, let's say, a cashmere sweater, uh, at, for instance. So we'll be looking uh, for evidence of what's going on in that category. What we're finding right now in beauty is the categories are actually pretty healthy, but we're seeing some marginal trade down across price tiers. So we're going to watch that. You know, my, my suspicion is if, if foot traffic it comes under pressure, that will affect uh, the beauty category because a lot of that is also impulse consumption when you're in the store. So that from my coverage, you know, that's probably the more the discretionary end uh, of, of uh, the stocks that I look at. Uh, one of the other companies I cover, Spectrum Brands, they announced this morning and they sell a lot of uh, kitchen appliances and that continues to be weak. So we're expecting that to be uh, a, an ongoing area of sluggishness across a lot of the companies we look at. And we also noticed, you, met, you mentioned that, and also big ticket items we saw from the likes of, of Home Depot, seeing people pulling back on things like, you know, some of these big home improvements instead of making sort of slight changes there. Is that something that's expected to continue? Based on all the work we've done with retailers, it looks like that will continue. And, you know, we're, what we're trying to do is get visibility on what the curve will look like in 2024. That's the work we're doing right now. 
So is this going to be much more of a first half dynamic where the consumer is kind of under pressure, but then when we start lapping some of the weakness we saw this year, we'll start seeing some improvements in the back half of next year. So we're, what we're doing work on right now is trying to understand what the shape of 2024 will look like. If you really think about what's happening, right, outside of maybe some potential dynamics in the, in the real estate market, what could effectively be happening right now is just a normalization of spend. So when you look at it versus 2019, things still look okay. But when you look at it versus last year, where things were really uh, hot and heavy when it, when it came to spending, you're seeing year over year drags. And so when we get into next year, will we see some of that subside? And so that's really what we're focused on right now. So normalization of spend from an investment standpoint, should stock pickers out there, I mean, should they be looking at this as kind of the new reality when you try to make those comparisons? Yeah, I think I think at least for the next uh, six to nine months, I think we we should be operating with the assumption that things will will be under pressure. I mean, certainly, you know, even though we cover consumer staples companies, we've been very worried about promotional spend. We're starting to see that manifest right now, and we think it's going to get worse before it gets better because we we do think the economy and the macro picture will deteriorate over the next several uh, quarters. And I want to ask you about the, the growth that we're seeing in real income, especially compared to where it was last year. Goldman is predicting that growth in real in income will be 4% this year, nearly 3% next year. That's, that's your, your income adjusted for inflation. With, with that in mind, then, which companies are best positioned to really weather this storm heading into 2024? Yeah, one, one of the themes that we're seeing across our coverage is actually not even category specific. It's really about experiences. If you really think what happened with all the Swifties during the summer, right? Experiences have really been driving the lion's share of consumption. So if you really think about it, it's bifurcated to experiences and basic goods. All the stuff in the middle has basically been where a lot of the weakness has been coming. And so when you think about companies and innovation, how important that is, the new flavor of energy drinks or that new beauty product, right? Or that new candy, um, you know, uh, Hershey's going to be launching Reese with uh, caramel. Consumers are looking for new experiences. And that, I think, is really going to be the key theme for next year in terms of how companies perform. Who is innovating the best? Who has the best product in the marketplace? Are they getting the right shelf space? Right. So we think about a couple of companies under our coverage, Monster Energy. Um, we think they, they have a, a very good outlook. You know, We're very bullish on, on that company. Constellation Brands, they sell the Corona and Modelo Especial brands. They've done a very good job, and they've had some new product innovation that I think will be helpful to their business over the next 12 months. Uh, and then you can even think about some of the beauty companies like Cody, which is a, a company that we're recommending that has done a lot of innovation, especially in the influencer space. Um, and we think that's going to pick up in 2024 as well. Yeah, Cody, one that uh, we've been hearing a lot lately. Uh, Nick Modi, RBC Capital Markets Managing Director. Good to talk to you on this Friday. Have a good weekend. You too. Well, this week's softer than expected CPI data sent stocks rallying. The data is encouraging to investors ahead of the Fed meeting next month, and their confidence is showing in different assets, specifically small cap stocks, maybe having their day in the sun, bet to outpace the S&P 500. To tell us more, Sam Stovall, CFRA Research Chief Investment Strategist, joins us today. Um, Sam, before we get into the small caps, I want to get your view on the market moves that we saw this week, a huge rally coming on the back of a softer than expected CPI print. How much of that was justified or you think the market's kind of getting ahead of itself a little? Well, Akiko, I think it is justified, uh, but you always have to wonder whether it's simply a short covering rally. Uh, I think what has kept down the small caps uh, in this uh, early part of this bull market has been the continued um, hawkish actions and rhetoric by the Fed. Because if you go back to the early 1980s, when the Russell 2000 first came out, um, basically looking at all bull markets, they were accompanied by a decline in interest rates, except for the uh, 1988 bull market. Uh, that one, we still saw higher interest rates, but this time around, certainly uh, very much on the upscale for interest rate hikes. So I think that's been holding back the small caps, but from a valuations perspective, they look very attractive. And I think investors are chomping at the bit, waiting for the gate to open. So Sam, as you look within smaller and mid caps then, which ones have the most room to run? 
Hey, Rochelle. Uh, well, those areas that uh, have done very well, that you can get sort of an idea of which ones are favored by the market based on how well they've done in this past week. Healthcare, financials, consumer discretionary were the three best performing S&P small cap 600 sectors. And the only one that declined was energy. And then sort of pulling the uh, the uh, leaves of the artichoke back a bit, you can see consumer electronics, life sciences, tools, and passenger airlines, along with hotels and personal care products, did very, very well, uh, rising by double digits, whereas a lot of the groups in the energy space were in negative territory. All of this comes against the backdrop, Sam, of what you could argue is, is still an uncertain one in the economy. On the one hand, you've got inflation pulling back. This week, we saw yields pu pull back in conjunction with that. And yet, you've still got this statement coming through from Fed Chair Powell last week, who said, look, I'm not sure that the monetary policy right now is restrictive enough to bring inflation back down to 2%. So what expectation do you operate under if you're an investor? Well, I, I guess you sort of tiptoe uh, through this situation because add to it comments from your prior guest talking about a slowdown in consumer spending, cautiousness about a possible recession in 2024. And we know historically that while the S&P has declined about 35% on average during market declines associated with recession since 1980, small caps have fallen by about 40%. So, you know, they tend to be more vulnerable. Uh, but I would say right now, at least in the near term, this market is willing to climb this wall of worry because we're in a very favorable seasonal spot right now. Uh, and also the full election year for first term presidents has been positive every time since World War II. And Sam, as you look at the, the holding pattern for the Fed now, especially with the latest data showing perhaps it can take its foot off the brakes here, a lot of people thinking, look, the, the worst is behind them in terms of Fed rate hikes, but then markets jumping ahead to potentially two rate cuts, perhaps by mid-2024. What, what are your opinions on that? Are they jumping the gun here? Uh, yes, and no, you're not leading the witness. Uh, I do believe that they are jumping the gun. Our feeling is that even though on average the Fed has started to cut rates nine months after the last rate hike, uh, that I think that we're likely to see the first rate cut take place in the third quarter, and that it'll be one cut in Q3, one cut in Q4 of 2024, because the Fed has said over and over again, they don't want to make the same mistakes that were made in the 1970s where they changed their course too quickly, uh, thinking that the smoldering embers were uh, ready to go out rather than reignite. Well, appreciate you, as always, for joining us. Great to see you. Sam Stovall, CFRA Research Chief Investment Strategist. Have a great weekend. Thanks. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm senior health reporter Anjali Kimlani. Big tech has made its presence known in the healthcare industry over the last decade, and Amazon remains bullish on this sector. The e-commerce giant's push into healthcare with its online pharmacy has provided millions of people with discounts and made prescription drugs more affordable for customers. So to wrap up Yahoo Finance's Healthcare Week, I'm joined by Dr. Vin Gupta, Amazon Pharmacy Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Anjali. Thank you for having me. I want to start off with everything that Amazon Pharmacy has done. It is the three-year anniversary as well, uh, I believe, of this law of the launch of this program. And we've seen how uh, over the years there has been a buildup of a number of different health care uh, strategies for Amazon. But let's focus on the pharmacy for a second. You've got uh, the $5 RX pass, you've got discounts, you've got automatic coupons, which, as we understand, has saved customers $9 million uh, over the course of the since the launch. So how does this all play into sort of what the future is for this segment? Well, Anjali, you know, I say this as a pulmonologist uh, right outside an ICU here today. I, I, I have a, a foot in both worlds, traditional healthcare and what we're building at Amazon, specifically at Amazon Pharmacy. As you pointed out, all these feature sets are, are really set to address the biggest problem in healthcare, which is patient information, patient awareness of services, of products that can actually result in lower costs to them for their prescription medications. We have a prime prescription savings program that Anjali was shown by an external group of pharmacists from the University of Toledo to actually save more money than when patients use, say, their copay for 20 of the most common generic medications across the country. That price transparency gets talked about a lot. It's uh, price transparency in medicine doesn't really exist at scale. We're trying to solve for that at pharmacy through your uh, through the coupons program, which you just talked about. If there's a coupon to make branded medications like insulin products cheaper, we're going to figure out a way to automate that so patients don't have to think about it. That's exactly what's underpinning the coupons program that has saved over $9 million for patients across the country that utilize our services. It's basically just automating a manufactured coupon for a branded medication that we support through this program versus having somebody having to download a bunch of paperwork and go through a very complicated morass of, of, of hurdles to get those savings. 85% of the time, the American patient across the country doesn't actually realize those savings, Anjali. We're trying to make that easier. But at the same time, you know, with all this growth, we've also seen how there are some limitations to what you can do right now. What, what can you explain about sort of how this industry works and why maybe branded drugs or more expensive drugs aren't something that Amazon can address right now? Well, you know, I would say as part of the coupons program, every every medication that's part of that, for example, is a branded medication uh, for which there is a coupon. We're working directly with manufacturers to see, can we actually automate that as part of the checkout process for patients so they don't have to, to go find it? Right? But to your broader point, so what are the more systemic issues across healthcare that we feel across our businesses, not just pharmacy, we can address? We know medication non-adherence impacts 50% of American adults across the country. One in two don't have access to basic primary care when they're still acutely ill. There's a huge supply demand mismatch in terms of healthcare workers that will be needed by the end of the decade versus the rising demand as we have an aging population. What are we doing? We're focusing on getting care through Amazon Clinic and One Medical, brick and mortar, One Medical in over 30 uh, zip codes across the country, 30 major cities, Amazon Clinic, asynchronous and, and, and synchronous telemedicine in all 50 states. So getting care much easier now. Uh, we just uh, launched a prime benefit, $9 a month for prime members, where you can actually get that one medical membership, get that in-person care, or get virtual care through one medical, and really address that issue about access that I talked about earlier. Get medications through Amazon Pharmacy. We're trying to make it easier. Uh, getting as fast as possible, but also, again, focusing on price transparency and then getting well, just really focusing on, on staying healthy, making sure patients have the information they need to focus on prevention, not focus on sickness. So th th that's really been the core here. And we think we can really be part of the solution 
to address some of these systemic ills that you're seeing across the country. I'm glad you brought up One Medical because we do know that now this has sort of formed a nice little chain uh, for Amazon's health strategy, getting patients the care through One Medical and then finding uh, the medications through the pharmacy, uh, a nice little tie-in. Uh, it has been many years building up to this and Amazon has previously struggled in the space. What's changed and why are we seeing you know, a little bit more uh, sort of outspokenness from the the, from the company now. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, you know what's changed is we've seen impact. This is the three third year anniversary of the founding of Amazon Pharmacy, one year anniversary of Amazon Clinic, one medical a, a has been growing just over the past decade. But you know they're putting me out there as a as a pulmonologist to to talk about a lot of what we're doing here because there's a lot of excitement on the clinical impact here, Anjali, that we feel like we're driving. Um, when it comes to again cost savings for brands and medications, we're approaching upwards of ten million dollars saved for patients. That means something for cost related medication on adherence. Cost drivers are a big reason why people don't save their medications. You mentioned one medical, one medical through their impact program for chronic disease. Anjali, it's seeing three times improvement in, in A1C control for diabetics that enter that program versus usual standard of care because they have a very engaging platform. We're seeing real traction here in terms of clinical impact. We've been at this now for a little bit. We recognize we're still early, but also that connectivity. Should somebody want a quick triage point? It's cold and flu season. They're waking up. Maybe they feel unwell. They can go to one medical, get a same day appointment in, in under an hour. So they need to see somebody in a city we have a physical presence in. In under an hour, they can get that touch point, get triage, get a diagnosis. Within that same day, say if they're in Seattle, and get medications delivered right to their doorstep. So that triage to treat, that connectivity of our services, should somebody want that seamlessness, is now available to more people across the country. And of course, exciting things like drone delivery on the horizon. So we'll definitely be hanging out to see more of that. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Vin Gupta, Amazon Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. Back to you, Kiko. All right, fascinating conversation there. Thanks so much for that, Anjali. Well, stocks are trading slightly lower this morning, but despite the red arrows on the board, all three averages are on track for the third straight week of gain. So which sectors drove this week's markets rally? Let's bring in our very own Jared Blickery at his favorite spot by the yes. Interactive. Uh, you can always catch me here. Thank you, Akiko. Uh, yeah, it's not just the U.S. Around the world, uh, all of these indices are in the green, as you can see. The lowest one, China, that is the laggard. But Russell 2000 is number one in the world among most of the major indices. That's up 5.3%. If I just quickly pull up a five-day chart, you can see after that Monster Day Tuesday, that was actually when we peaked. But we have only come off a little bit since then. On a three-year basis, still camping out by these lows and in this giant trading range, but let me just tell you, I'm, I'm going to read off the countries on the top just to show what a broad swath this is. We have Brazil, we have Germany, Spain, Japan, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, all up more than 3%. And by the way, the Nasdaq's up 2.1%, the S&P 2, and the Dow is up 1.8%. But let me get to the sector action, and that's kind of uh, what we're interested in here. Really interesting to see real estate up 4.4%. Not often that we get a, a big outsized day in real estate, but we did Tuesday. Uh, that was one of the biggest days in years. And you can see that monster gain, excuse me, Monday. Um, and then also taking a look at materials, we did a, have a huge drop in the dollar, biggest drop in one day earlier on Tuesday. Consumer discretionary, that's up 3.4. Financials, utilities, industrials, all of those outperforming the S&P 500. Just wanted to quickly show you what's happened over the last 15 days. Tech up 13%. That's when we got that rally off the October 27th lows. But just sticking with what we're seeing this week, I'm going to go into some of our leaders. First thing that sticks out, what's negative? Baito, that is my Bitcoin ETF. That's down 3%, uh, although it did break out earlier than stock. So it's sitting on some nice gains over the last month. KRE, remember regional banks? Well, they're number one this week, up 9.5%. Then we have solar up 8%, disruption 8, meme stock 6, home builders, retail, small caps, that's uh, the Russell 2000 ETF, and then it looks like transports as well. Um, interesting, interesting to track some of the uh, disruption winners this week. Here we have the ARC components. Tesla had a really nice week, up 10%, Shopify 11%. Uh, one of the things I was writing about in the morning brief yesterday was this 
overcrowding uh, that we tend to see at the end of the year. And indeed, we could very well see that. But my cautionary note is it don't expect so uh, stocks like Peloton to get back to break even you know, those 2021 highs anytime soon. Uh, also taking a look at China, it's been uh, interesting. Alibaba had a pretty bad week. That was down 6%. But aside from that, China also joining the parade here. Um, and then today's options expiration date, not any big fireworks, but another thing that happened this week was CPI. This chart goes back four years and it charts what happened on CPI days, job days, and Fed days. Those are the three big things guiding the market. And we had the biggest CPI day in exactly one year. And uh, CPI has been closely tracking the rally in the S&P 500 that we see in the purple line. Suffice to say, investors are looking for that end of the year ride here. Here's what the VIX tends to do into the end of the year. That is go down. That means it's bullish for stocks. And here's what it has actually done. So maybe some of the heavy lifting been done. Uh, we'll have to see. But uh, expiration, uh, excuse me, hopes for the end of November are that we do get a continued rally into the end of the month. And uh, that has been the case so far, guys. And Jared, is it still too early to predict a Santa Claus rally? You know, uh, in light of the fact that we have pumpkin spice lattes in August, I don't think so, <laughs> although I would avoid it. Ask me again next week. <laughs> Will do. A very own Jared Blakery. Thank you so much. All right, we have all your markets action just ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, we are seeing U.S. Treasury yields pushing a little higher today as investors hope for a dovish pivot in betting the Fed is done with rate hikes after softer economic data this week. So if you're in the market to buy a house, is now the time to strike? For more on this, we have Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomberger and Danny Romero. Guys, it's not every day that we have you both in studio, right? But it's interesting because we have been having these separate conversations about where rates are, how that affects sort of the buyer that's in the market. 
I mean, Jen, let me start with you. I mean, how are you looking at this right now in the context of where the Fed could be in their policy? Yeah, hey, Akiko. So uh, we've certainly seen the yield on the 10-year Treasury uh, back off from the levels that we saw uh, around 5%. Now we're trading around levels last seen uh, after the Fed's FOMC meeting in September. And the major driving factor there is the fact that we're getting data on inflation that is showing continued progress. Now, the question is, will we continue to get that data? We still know that the Fed has another rate hike on the table. Whether they pull that trigger or not remains to be seen. And at the same time, there are other factors that are influencing the Treasury market. We know that the U.S. Treasury is issuing uh, record amounts of Treasuries. We know that the Fed is continuing to roll off its balance sheet with quantitative tightening. So these are all uh, factors that could also uh, contribute upward pressure to the yield on the 10-year. Does it go to 5%? You know, bond traders telling me maybe not, but could it go back up to four and three quarters? Yes. And that's still going to provide a lot of pain, right? Because, Danny, we see home mortgage rates uh, that are uh, influenced by the yield on the 10-year. Yes, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate does follow the 10-year Treasury yield. And, yes, there was some wiggle room towards home buying to, uh, this week. We saw the 30-year fixed mortgage rate dip down to that 7.4% this week. Is that enough to really fuel people back into the market? That's up for debate. I mean, rates are still above 7%. And if we take a look at how what the median down payment is right now, it's about $30,000. And that made up 14.7% of the sales price. So it's still expensive mm -hmm. to buy a home right now. And, you know, there's also data that shows that sellers are getting a little bit antsy because of that. And so they're offering incentives, whether that is cash for repairs or mortgage rate buy downs, which they upfront the cost to lower down the rate on a loan. These things are happening. And if, this, if the buyer doesn't get the deal that they want, this incentive, they're walking away from the deal completely because it is so expensive. And so there are buyers that are really cautiously about this budget cautious, about home buying right now. So yes, rates are still pretty moving up and down. It's it's a volatile market still. And like you said, the Fed hasn't uh, pretty much said no to the possibility of another rate hike. They haven't ruled it out. So with that in mind, there is still a lot of uncertainty whether or not the 30-year fixed mortgage rate will even dip down below even 7%. Well, I mean, to your point, everyone is pointing the finger at the Fed, right? Because you had mortgage rates hitting 8%. But, you know, it's affordability also comes down to supply on the market, right? And the fact that we have a, like 80% of Americans who are sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or lower, they're not really looking to sell their homes. So you have that factor at play, which is keeping prices near record levels, contributing to the affordability issue. Uh, I had Meredith Whitney on just last week on Yahoo Finance's Invest. She made the case that baby boomers are going to need to downsize, and that is going to bring supply back onto the market, and maybe we'll see some balancing out there. Her prediction is later next year. What do you think? Well, I, I will say to the baby boomers, just one quick note on that is that Barclays actually argues that baby boomers, they, uh, they're such a big population, but compared to the younger population, they, there is some leverage for the younger population to squeeze in there to get into a home. The, the fact that the baby boomers will soon, that generation will soon, obviously uh, some life circumstances will happen. Um, we'll move on to the next generation and that will be millennials. But I think Rochelle wants to, to dive in a little bit here. Yeah, because um, Jennifer, I wanted to direct this to you because I know we, where we look at where interest rates are now, if you give us some context as to where we were. We've had historically low interest rates for a very long time here. So are we getting to a sense of a, a new normal here? I know it sounds bad. It's one of those things where people are like, I shouldn't have to just suck it up. These are incredibly tough times when people are trying to get into the housing market. But give us some context here as to, as to where rates are. Yeah, Rochelle, how many times have I heard my parents tell me, well, we had to buy houses when mortgage rates were like, you know, 20 percent. Like you guys, you know, 8 percent, that's still low. But, you know, given what where we are with prices, that compounds it. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, I mean, I think we're in a new era of higher rates. We are not going back to... 3% mortgage rates or lower. 
that was a uh, product of a crisis of the pandemic. And unless we have a major shock to this economy, I don't see that happening. Um, so we're probably going to be staying in this 4 to 5 percent range for some time to come unless, like I said, there's some black swan event. Well, we could talk about four this. 4 to 5 percent, though. 4 to 5 percent, though, Jen. I mean, that if you're talking about like mortgage rates, I mean, that, that's welcome news, right? <laughs> we're talking about 7 and a half percent. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. I mean, I will tell you, as somebody who's in the market for a house, I'll take it. Right, four right. 4 to 5 percent. Well, I will well, take, take that. Well, I'm saying 4 to 5 percent on the 10-year treasury, yes, which is no, going to I, influence yes. no, mortgage no, rates. Understand. So that'll keep your mortgage rates higher there at Kiko, but yeah. Yeah, and, and to Danny's point, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about inventory. So many factors that shape all that. But um, great to have both of you on Jen Schomburger and Danny Romero joining us on that conversation. Well, CPI data was flat this month, but in some metro areas, inflation is still going strong. Miami has the highest inflation rate of any U.S. metro area. The city's annual inflation rate is 7.4 percent, more than double the national average. What's driving this inflation? Well, more people moving into the area, chasing better weather and lower taxes, boosting demand for homes and energy. Large financial firms like Blackstone and Citadel setting up some outposts in the area, also contributing to higher prices. So this comes after South Florida promised to become a financial center, dubbing itself Wall Street South. And Rochelle wasn't just Wall Street South. They also were really, really active in bringing in all the tech money. But Look, I mean, this is something that we have seen in so many different cities. When it is booming, you know, people talk about San Francisco now, but you think about early on, Seattle's another one. It was about sort of the, the, the money, the property really being driven higher by those companies that were coming in, the millionaires that were coming in and setting up shop mm -hmm. there. So not entirely surprising. It is interesting to me, though, that the argument initially to go to Miami was about being more cost competitive with the lower taxes that were involved in Florida. But if, if you're BlackRock, you're probably fine. Yeah. You're probably doing okay. <laughs> and, and it's one of those things like, be careful what you wish for, because look at where Wall Street is located. In, in New York City, one of the most expensive cities to live in in the world, it comes with a cost. Look at Silicon Valley, look at the costs that came up from there. So if a lot of these people who had more money, they wanted to make their dollar stretch a bit further, relocating, to, to Florida, even though you're seeing a lot of you're seeing a lot of you know return to return to office, but a lot of people who relocated to Florida still staying there, and all those big paychecks pushing up inflation. People have that money to spend. You wonder how that's influencing the local economy, that their ability to be able to keep up with these prices. So it's it's that double-edged sword. You get the weather, you know, you get the 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 income tax-free uh, income there, but inflation sticking around a lot longer than expected there. Yes, the weather is nice, but. I don't know, Rochelle, the humidity. I don't think I could do it. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Clearly a lot more people who are willing to withstand that. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back.
We're taking a look at shares of Li Auto Inc. The Chinese automaker says it will begin mass production and delivery of its first fully electric car in February. The new vehicle, which received more than 10,000 orders by noon, boasts a range of 310 miles, get this, on a single 12-minute charge, as Li Auto aims to combat range anxiety for EV users. Now, Li Auto is also set to join Hong Kong's Hang Seng Exchange, effective December 4th. I mean, a lot of people, you know, looking at some of these, this is a multi-person uh, vehicle here, not available, of course, uh, in the US or, or in the EU at the moment, but you're looking at a price tag of $83,000. So you, you're getting that sort of that range anxiety handle, but the price tag, $83,000 here, Akiko. When you think about just how competitive it already is in the Chinese EV market, you add another car into the mix as well. Rochelle, the thing that gets me is 12 minute charge. I mean, forget the 310 miles because there are cars out there that have that range. The 12 minute charge has got to be the most appealing. Yeah. You, you figure we'll that's got to be the game the changer because, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fingers crossed at some point because I believe BYD might be the first one to bring a Chinese EV to the US. They're at least planning to in 2025. So we'll, we'll see, but that 12 minute charge, a game changer. Yeah, certainly going to be a big one. Well, for the first time in 20 years, since 2004, the new Toyota Prius has been named the car of the year by Motor Trend. However, competition remains tight in the space. With more, let's bring in Motor Trend CEO Alex Wellen to talk about the car of the year alongside our very own Praz Subramanian. Um, good to talk to you, Alex. I, I feel like we're kind of back to, not back to the future, sort of back to where we were before. We've been talking so much about EVs, but a huge, huge pickup in sales around hybrid cars. Why is this the one that you chose? Uh, the Prius is kind of undeniable. It's been 20 years, right, since we awarded the car of the year. But now everything from the value, the safety, the design, exactly how it works, the engineering, the efficiency, its purpose, it's just um, one of these cars that after seeing it designed the way it does, and they have 20 years of experience at Toyota, we absolutely loved it. I've driven it and hybrids, are really the topic right now because we got so excited about EVs and Praz knows this too, that uh, we we forgot for a moment about the hybrids that were out there and we were trying to make this leap to internal from internal combustion right to um, to fully electric and I think hybrids really are a bridge a high bridge. <laughs> you know, Alex, you know, you guys have a lot of viewers that come to Motor Trend both online on the channel. Of course, on the website, what are they saying about the Prius and, and hybrids in general? Is there sort of a resurgence there? There is. I mean, when you look at the cars, we have our buyer's guide. So we look at all kinds of different cars and we kind of soup to nuts talk about these cars and we test them. We're, we're, we're vigorous in all of our testing. And then you look at the rankings, right? Over and over, Tesla still comes up number one, um, at least for cars. And the Toyota RAV4 comes up for SUVs, for the hybrid. But eight out of 10 of the cars that people are looking at, are EVs or are hybrids. And then when you look at our rankings, they go to the SUVs, but then they immediately go to the EVs and they go to the hybrids. So we haven't seen this drop, essentially. Hybrids definitely are on the up and up. And I think that we're gonna see that more over the next few years as we look to bridge kind of where we go from here to there, I think. So you mentioned that um, in terms of ultimate car rankings, SUVs are first ball by EVs and then hybrids. Uh, I guess, are you saying, are you seeing there, is there any kind of drop off though with regards to EV uh, search, uh, pop, not popularity, but, but interest? Because we've been seeing a lot of people demand and the EV started coming down a bit because prices are so high now, lack of infrastructure, things like that. Are you guys sort of seeing that on the site as well? Yeah, we have seen, again, I would put the fully EVs at the top, but as a general matter, anecdotally looking at all the traffic, I think that you're seeing a surge in hybrids because mm -hmm. infrastructure, and range anxiety, right? We're all worried about whether uh, we can get from here to there and will there be somewhere to actually power up. And then of course price, uh, price is higher. For a certain segment of the audience, it's perfect. But for, for those who want to get into an EV-like or electrification, uh, the Prius is incredible, right? 45 miles it can go on, on, on a charge and uh, it's $27,000, which is uh, unheard of. So Alex, let me follow up on that point because you know, certainly EVs can be quite decis uh, divisive when you think about where this debate has gone. We certainly heard those who are more in the ice car camp say, look, I told you, EVs don't have the runway to go. What you're saying is that it sounds like consumers want an EV, 
but the price point doesn't necessarily match where they want to be, and there's still concerns about infrastructure, which is why they're opting for a hybrid. Is that right? Yeah, I think, look, I wouldn't say that all people in, in this category want to go to a hybrid. I think it is a special category of people that have a certain lifestyle. There's so many people who want to go directly into an EV. But if you live in Los Angeles, where I am, it's not something you think about a lot because you have the infrastructure there and it might be in the right price point or the right range. But there is this new cohort or segment of people who really want this hybrid because it will bridge. It will hybrid them from here to there. And for the time being, they can, they can use this to go there 40 miles and not have to fill up on, on, a, on a tank of gas. So I think what we're seeing right now is Yes, a slight slowing in the marketplace because there is a segment of people who want to get into this that know that eventually they'll be in an EV, but they're just not ready yet because they don't have the infrastructure around them to support that car. So Alex, you know, I, I want to note that the, the Prius that we've been talking about actually beat the updated Tesla yes. Model 3 Highland. Um, I don't know if you can quickly talk about that, but also I also want to also again touch on something that Akiko brought up with Rochelle Rich earlier about how Lee Auto and some of these Chinese EV makers are have their sites on the US. You guys did a documentary recently about how they might be using Mexico as a way in. So That's if you could right. talk to me quickly about both these things, I would, I would be so happy. Yeah, yeah, okay, so let's see. So uh, blasphemy, like untouchable, the Tesla. And there's a certain type of status that comes with driving this, this Tesla, as is the Prius, right? There's a very passionate group of people who love um, their Prius and will love the new design, which is very, very sleek. I think the price point really is, is really where that comes down and just this history of being able to create these cars and the hybrid, obviously the Tesla is fully electric. So it solves a different problem for people who are trying to get into that market. For those who are ready for EV, many, many will go to the Tesla still. As far as our documentary, we did a documentary, our reporters went down to Mexico and they spent time with the Chinese uh, manufacturers there. And it's a staging area. I mean, they had zero penetration. Now they have 9% penetration in all sales for EVs and hybrids. Um, in Mexico. In Mexico. Uh, but what's interesting is not only are they doing so much more business there, for many people, they feel like it may be an end run to getting into the U.S. It's very difficult to go directly from China into the U.S. And there are a lot of rules that prevent them from doing that. But if they are able to do it from Mexico, and that's what we were learning, that may be the way we see a lot of these cars coming. So we have that documentary on the website as well, too, and people can take a look. Cool. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Certainly a very fascinating documentary there. Motor Trend CEO Alex Wellen, as well as Yahoo Finance's Praz Subramanian, joining in on the conversation. Well, the fallout from Elon Musk continues after the Tesla CEO endorsed his anti-Semitic post as the actual truth. The White House being the latest to respond, saying, we condemn this abhorrent promotion of anti-Semitic and racist hate in the strongest terms, which runs against our core values as Americans. So, Rochelle, um, this certainly not uh, abating in terms of a controversy for X, formerly Twitter, with the White House now weighing in as well. I mean, for those who have not been following, this was a repost that Elon Musk had, but it was an anti-Semitic post. He essentially elevated that by commenting, it's the actual truth. And that has really set off things for X, making it very difficult, by the way, for the new CEO, Linda Yaccarino. You had IBM suspending its advertising, X reportedly getting calls from other advertisers who are saying, why is my advertisement, why is my ad showing up next to anti-Semitic comments? And then you've got the issue of Tesla, right? I mean, anytime Elon Musk says something, you inevitably tie that to less Tesla because he is the face of the company, and by the way, one of the biggest bulls on the market, Ross Gerber, last night on CNBC, mm. talking about this, saying, I mean, this is complete brand destruction. I mean, it's true. And he was saying that he, he tweeted, or I guess x that he was getting all these calls from clients trying to dump the Tesla stock. He himself was saying he was going to get rid of his Tesla, was going to switch to, to a Rivian, one of the competitors. Uh, he went on to tweet, I've never had this with any company I've ever invested in ever in my life where the CEO of the company himself does so many detrimental things that is destroying the brand. Because it goes beyond sort of this idea of purchasing X as being a distraction. It's now Elon Musk himself and the words that he's saying on this massive platform in X, they're now having a domino effect. And as we saw 
Immediately after some of that pushback, after we saw that he wasn't going to appear at the APEC summit anymore, a lot of people were wondering, was it because of those comments? At first, the, the public comment was that it was a scheduling conflict, but you have to wonder now the backlash and, and how this is going to play out, or whether investors will just focus on the fundamentals of the company and somehow separate Elon Musk, the person and, the, and that brand, from what's happening with Tesla's shares. Well, and what's only sort of added to investor concerns is where Tesla is right now. We were just having a conversation about the strength in the hybrid, but really when you look at the EV market, there are concerns about increasing competition, the price cuts that will have to come with it, you know, more competition for Tesla. What does that mean in terms of the market share they already have? So Tesla is trying to navigate all of these challenges right now. Certainly from an investor standpoint, not helpful when you've got the CEO, the face of the company out there or elevating, amplifying anti-Semitic comments when you've got real issues with the company. No, and it's true. And I mean, despite Linda Yaccarino coming out and saying, look, we, we don't support any sort of anti-Semitic comments, we have to go back to their guideline that said awful but lawful is the standard by which they're going to be gauging free speech. And so really putting themselves in a precarious position here. Yeah, it certainly feels like we're back to that conversation in the early days after Elon Musk purchased X and that there were concerns about what it would mean for advertisers. All right, let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. Uh, we were talking about a pretty flat day um, early on in the trade today. Red arrows right now, but the Dow down 27 points, the S&P 500 flat and the Nasdaq down 16. All three major indices, by the way, still on track uh, to end the, no uh, end the week on a positive note. That's it for now. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akupo.